Lots to talk about on, on diet. Diet, as you know, it, it has many controversial aspects of things. Because diet is a is a science based on what we call good observational data and limited amount of randomized controlled trials. So we have um, um, quite a difficulty synthesizing what is the best diet. But one of the things that's been very popular is the keto diet for weight reduction. So. We're going to give you um, some options, and I think we're going to hopefully give you the best option for a keto diet. And um, and I'm going to encourage everybody to try different diets at different times. And uh, on September 14th, we're going to have our first go at this, and um, we're going to give 30 days of the diet. Now, it's interesting. I was just talking to my wife, and she's very committed on some aspect of things that she's going to help support, and I have a whole team to help support my uh keto diet for the last uh, next 30 days. Um, but she's going to say that if I go on the keto diet, she's not going to drink for, for a month. So um, that's going to be a fun challenge for, for, for both of us. So I always like to make some challenges, and uh, I'll challenge everybody along the way to be a little bit healthier. So uh, I appreciate her efforts, and we're sort of, uh, we put together some foods that we're going to start with, and I'll share some of, some of the things we're going to do, and hopefully some of the things that you may want to consider as well. Let's have the next slide, please. Now, um, as you know, um, we still live in uh, a COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, yesterday, uh, McMaster had a ground round on uh, on this. It can be actually put on YouTube over in the next short while. But I'll show you a few slides I took that you might find kind of interesting. I can get to the next slide. So COVID has taught us a lot. Um, and one of the things that I've learned is that, that we need to learn how to adapt to change. So on your left is you can see what happened in Canada. On the top right is that uh, early after March break, uh, Canada had its first um, big uh, had its surge, and it's, the surge has come down. Um, uh, and now now we're looking uh, to enter uh, uh, second phase. And the Americans on the bottom um, are, are, are in trouble right now. And, and the question is why? Uh, the problem with COVID. 19, it, it's a brand new disease, and for a disease that's been around for less than a year, it's amazing what we learned and what we don't learn, uh, or haven't learned yet. And um, what I want to express to people is the science of medicine is an evolving area. As you can see right now, we're recommending masks at this stage, or at the beginning, we said that it's just for healthcare providers. And there's a lot we still don't know. The problem with COVID-19, the vast majority of information that we have is based on observation. Uh, observations are good, looks at data, but they're, they're, they're prone to selection bias. And, uh, you know, why is Canada so much different in the States? Is it because uh, uh, we locked down earlier than the States, for instance? Is that the reason or that we're wearing more masks compared to Americans? Um, um, is it partly because of social economic classes, as, as, as more wealthy people don't have to expose themselves compared to the poor individuals? Or is it just plain luck in part? And I think a combination of all of the above. And so you can see right now is that uh, we are expecting a surge. And so far, there hasn't been a huge surge, at least in Ontario right now. And I want to, first of all, uh, thank them. Um, our, our Premier Ford, who's done, I think, an admirable job of from um, uh, leadership here and uh, working hard on that. And uh, I appreciate uh, him as a, as, a, as a good person, a good human being. He's listening to science. He's also a common sense person. He'll tell you exactly where, what he feels. And I think that's important. And, uh, and uh, so that's important to, um, to say that uh, we're, we're learning and he's learning and everybody's learning with us. So it's a, a wonderful. Uh, First of all, thank you to uh, the, uh, the Palms of Ontario uh, for what they've done so far. Um, when I first saw what was happening in Italy, um, I was very scared, and I thought that, that we were going to be in a situation. I was, reading, I was reading my ICU books again about respirators again. I thought I'd be in the intensive care unit working there, so I'm glad I'm still in my office at this point in time. But we're still not out of the, out of the situation. and lots to learn about this disease or diseases. And so we're going to look a little bit. The disease of losing weight today. Next slide, please. And one of the next observations is that uh, is overall mortality appears to be less than one percent overall, and that's assuming that somewhere between two to 10, 10 times 
the event rate or the um, uh, people are asymptomatic and they don't actually get diagnosed. As you can see, below the age of 55, the mortality is well less than uh, 5%. Once you're around 65 or so, it goes up to about 5% and over the age of 85, unfortunately, 30% uh, of people will succumb to this uh, disease if you get it. Now, it's important to realize is that as we age, our immune system doesn't work as well, but we also have more risk factors. And there are very important steps that you can do to protect yourself. Um, and one of the things that uh, I've done is that some people have COVID-19 where they gained, or COVID-15 or COVID-10 where people are gaining weight. I'm COVID-minus COVID 10 to 15 at this point in time. So I'm losing weight. I'm encouraging you. Um, Stuart, what do you think I weigh this week? Um, I'm going to guess 170. Yeah, I'm up to 175, 71 and a half right now. Uh, so I gained a little bit of weight this week. But uh, I'm going to start my keto uh, diet on September 14th. I'm going to encourage many of you to join us. Um, and um, my goal weight is still that 165, and then I want to measure my body composition again. So, um, again, it, uh, it, uh, I went for a 35-kilometer bike ride today. I played tennis today. I did the stairs once this week. I didn't exercise as much as I could this week. Um, but um, uh, it's a long weekend. It's nice, so I'm going to be outside. For those who want to, we're playing tennis at 6.30 tomorrow morning very badly at Linden Park. We're going for a bike ride at 11 o'clock. Um, I'm going to try to fit in going shopping with uh, Chad uh, sometime this weekend. Chad's a good, healthy shopper, and uh, I'm going to get my uh, uh, my uh, keto diet in, in order. And I'll show you some of the things that we started already. Um, and uh, Chad's one of those individuals who uh, is more of a plant-based eater. Um, and there's certainly lots of value to that. And I'm going to show you the value where maybe a keto or a high-fat diet uh, or a low carbohydrate diet is important. Remember, um, uh, the pure keto diet is basically high fat, but I think as well as high protein can be something to think about in the right circumstance. And uh, one of the foods that I'm going to try to give up uh, in the next 30 days is going to be bread. Um, I had, I think, uh, four slices last night with, uh, with healthy peanut butter. But I'm gonna have to. I can have my peanut butter or my almond butter without the with bread soon coming. So uh, uh, it's important is that we need to learn to protect ourselves and to get healthier. Some of the information we got today from the British Medical Journal and, and many other sources. And one of the things that they're talking about is that diet and, and lifestyle are, are important, especially as there's going to be a, a, a second wave, next life wave, because um, you know the foundation to good health is, is, is diet. So. As of uh, yesterday, unfortunately, uh, what we know so far, at least 25 and a half million people have uh, been diagnosed with COVID-19, with unfortunately 851,000 people dying from this. I'm going to say that you don't usually die with, because of COVID. You die with COVID and something else. So um, getting older, having high blood pressure, having diabetes, uh, being a smoker, um, being in the suppressed um, are all important causes. And, and to me, um, um, get healthier. And instead of gaining five or 10 pounds, if you're five or 10 pounds lighter, well, I can't prove it, I think it gives you a much better opportunity to, to fight for this disease. Now, uh, when we think we know everything, we know nothing. Um, so is air travel a good thing or a bad thing? Well, um, but one of the things that, at first appearance, is you travel, you're in a closed space, you're often with crowded people, and you're close contact. And number four, which is not putting the slide, you're there with people for prolonged periods of time. Um, but you know what? It's not fully clear um, now what, what airlines have you know, refocused what they're doing is that they, they have their filtering system, their distancing, the masking, etc. On my travels right now, I haven't traveled extensively, but I've been very impressed how the airline industry has adapted. And so what I'm encouraging you to do is adapt your lifestyle to be healthier and to use science. Um, and, uh, and what I'm finding is that too many people are just running in a corner, isolating themselves, um, drinking too much, eating the wrong food, getting fatter, being scared, being depressed. Um, 
My thing to help you is right now is use good science, good knowledge to get better. Yes, uh, certainly um, spend time outside, uh, use social distancing, wear a mask at this point in time, uh, don't get involved in large groups. Um, there's so much to learn about this disease, other diseases, and your personal health. So I'm really proud of the team for all their hard work over time. And please encourage others to look at these webinars. Remember, they're all recorded. Uh, look at them at different times. Um, far too often, I know they're there. Friday nights is a bad night. Well, Saturday morning is a better morning than the And listen to them. Get, get the proper information. Um, next slide, please. Um, what we do know, again, is that uh, we have the tip of the iceberg. Um, and on the top there, you can see a traditional randomized control trial that was presented at the European Cardiology meeting this year, uh, a randomized data set telling us how to blood thinners better and with how to um, adjust them based on um, kidney function and other factors. But when it comes to... Um, um, of COVID-19 and other diseases such as diet, um, we only know small amounts. And one of the things is that we're reopening schools, um, and you can see a lot of people are upset, but on your left, there's a study that's saying open schools is not going to have an impact. And then on, your, on your right, there's another study saying open schools will have a, um, a, a worse impact. So the bottom line is that we truly do not know. This is a work in progress. Um, the rules... That, 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 that experts are telling you are the rules that should be followed at this stage. I'm, I'm amazed that everybody's an expert, uh, from teachers to politicians to your next door neighbor. I'm listening to real good experts to get advice and we'll pass that on to you. So as of today is that there's going to be a great experience. And one of the things about uh, learning right now is that I learned to use online learning better. Uh, I still make a, a lot of mistakes along the way, but I'm learning better. And I, I, I thank all these young people that make it easier for us to do this. I hope when people go back to education and school that they'll combine the best of online learning where things are recorded, you can stop and start, look at things three or four times. Um, Paul is going to organize a, a webinar on how we actually learn. Most of the learning we have is passive, and if you come to the doctor's office and the doctor tells you something, you remember somewhere between 5 to 20% of what's said uh, two weeks later. So saying it again is not going to work. So basically, what, what you need to do is to actively participate in your, life, in, in your, your health. Um, you should know your own blood pressure. You should know your own weight. You should know what medications you're taking, why you're taking them. Um, it should be the pharmacy uh, sending a note to the doctor and saying, I need renewals, that's basically a, a very much a failed intervention, is that uh, we want to make sure you're on the right medications at the right time, and you should know what's going on in your health. So we'll, we, and we have steps from um, these webinars are a good learning basis. People who want to learn about the medical health will organize a visit, uh, either virtually or in person, uh, where you can actually review your medical record with one of our uh, students and, and learn from this and get a copy of that. But you have to be more involved in your health. You need to learn more about this. And I'm, I want teachers to be teachers. Uh, we have to learn how to uh, teach in, the, in, a, in a COVID situation. Is it going to be virtually? Is it going to be in person, online? How are we going to do this? We're going to learn a lot. Yes, it's okay to be scared, but it's, okay. it's not okay to basically run away from the problem. Just this problem, next slide, please. Um, is that we have to somehow vaccinate 8.7 million, or I'm sorry, about 8.7 billion people if we do find a vaccine. That's not going to happen overnight. Um, it's not going to be a simple answer. Most people are, are looking at simple solutions. They're usually wrong. The solutions to health and to most things are relatively complex. So to me, this has been a great learning experience. Um, and... It hasn't been all as bad as it could, could be. Will it get worse? I don't know. Uh, I think I'm a better person uh, because of uh, the COVID situation. Remember, when someone gives you um, a lemon, you make lemonade. So we're going to make some lemonade tonight, and we're going to teach you how to, to lose 10 to 20 pounds uh, very effectively. And um, 
Uh, next slide, please. So I'm really excited about the, the presentations. And so this is um, um, uh, how I like to look. And uh, and um, that was me with a beard. Right now I'm clean shaven right now because I may have to wear an M95 mask so I, I shave at this point in time. And one of the things is that uh, I haven't conquered nighttime eating. And at the end of the presentation, we're going to take a look at uh, some of the things that you can actually do to improve on that. Um, Butter is still a four-letter word in my vocabulary. Um, I'm a, I have a sweet tooth. Um, um, I'm going to have a little celebration. Uh, my birthday's coming up in the next little while, and uh, I love chocolate. And I don't believe that uh, the great health benefits of chocolate or high uh, or, or, or dark chocolates uh, that sure taste good. Uh, one of the things, if I can learn to um, control my appetite at nighttime, uh, eliminate um, uh, you know so-called healthy bread. Um, and and limit carbohydrates in that way, I think I'll be better off. Next slide, please. Um, and this is how I, I see um, my keto diet. So um, I um, love love fish, and um, and one of the things is that I have to decide what to do about fish in the future. But right now, I'm eating fish, lots of salads, and we're gonna and uh, in the um, um, and they have a little bit of cheese, not very much. A lot more nuts and, and berries. Um, I love berries. You get them frozen or fresh. Um, and the corn season is almost over. Uh, I love farmer's corn, but if I'm going to go on my keto diet, corn's going to go away. So I have a couple more days to uh, eat corn. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the diet, my diet's going to look something along that, that line. I'm going to show you why. And uh, this is actually the kitchen counter today. So first on your left, that's with dinner. So on Friday is our pizza night, so Carrie and her sister, my, my wife Carrie and her sister, uh, that's a, um, a whole crust, there's a, a little bit of cheese, there's tomato sauce, there's olives, there's vegetables, um, and we're going to make the next one um, um, with cauliflower, and you can see on, on your left that little penguin, the number one beverage, is still water, uh, we're going to talk about quinoa and alkaline acid, lots of vegetables, you can see uh, um, gonna have lots of salad uh, and egg whites, um, and so that's sort of uh, some of the things that we're going to eat well is some, some fish. Um, and uh, my goal is to be uh, 165 pounds. That's my smart goal. Next slide, please. I'm going to be setting uh, for 30 days uh, at the start. Um, and one of the foods I do like a lot is um, is uh, peanut butter, almond butter. Um, and you can see you got to be careful. It's very rich in calories. Calories do matter. Um, one of the people well, people are saying, well, you know, I'm going to have a high fat diet. I'm going to have some natural potato chips. Um, 25 chips is 250 calories. It's rich in fat, but it, you don't feel full after that. So um, my high fat diet is not going to be potato chips whatsoever. Um, it's going to be some healthier choices, and we'll help you make some choices. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we have lots of excitement, and you can see is that there's lots of controversy about um, Ancel Keys in the 1950s. Uh, the science at that time suggested that we need to get rid of fat from the diet, and fat was replaced with carbohydrates. Uh, in that interval is that uh, in fact, mortality of heart disease over the next 20 in 25 years has decreased by 75 percent, uh, partially related to less, less smoking, better medical therapy, potentially changes in healthier diets, um, um, and part of it is just that people um, being more conscientious in, in the diet. So uh, now, uh, cholesterol content of food is, is still controversial. I don't limit my cholesterol content. I'm not as not as important. I'm eating a lot more egg whites, and that's going to be a way of limiting that. A sugar or carbohydrate in my diet. One of the treats here is these little, these little bars that you can get that are uh, still a little bit higher in sugar than you like, but they're, they're, they're richer in fat, rather than lots and nuts in there. Well, I like their pack size of about 100 calories, so that's going to be um, my, my treats. And um, and uh, so uh, that's a little nut bar there. Next slide, please. So I, I hope to share that with you. Um, one of the things is, should you eat hummus? Um, my wife says, no, you shouldn't eat hummus because it's still, um, remember that um, if you're on a pure uh, high-fat diet, if I have two tablespoons of olive oil, that will be 110, 110 calories. 
110 calories is a lot of calories, um, and kind of present that. Well, how much in two tablespoons are I most about 80 calories or 60 calories? There is some carbohydrates, so I'm going to put some hummus on selected vegetables like the broccoli, celery, um, cauliflower, I put peppers, and uh, I'm going to end that uh, with, some, with some almonds and walnuts now uh, as part of my uh, diet. I thought it was going to change. So um, I'm going to try to replace bread with, um, with, um, with the vegetables that are, have a uh, they don't have much sugar content to that, and, uh, and so I'm going to max with that and a little bit of hummus. But I have to keep that content down. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, so we, we have a, a, a nice story. So this wonderful lady uh, came into our clinic today, but here's the team that's going to be presenting tonight with us. Um, they're part of the, uh, the, uh, the, the the food gang will be here, but let's actually show this little uh, little story today. It just happened a couple of days ago, and it was just such a nice story. Let's, let's, uh, let's play that story if we can get that rolling, if that's okay. Uh, oh, but before we get that, I guess we know the story first. Let's go to the story. And, um, a difficult little while. Yeah. And from more on feet. Tell me about that. What do you mean that? The, well, the things I've done? Yeah, so you've been, so you know, like, um, we're trying to get healthier. When you walk into a wind, show me, show me, show me. Show you what I did? Yeah. I came in because over the past few months I have gained weight and it's not a good thing. So when I walked in the room, the first thing I did was get up, turned around and went, okay, Dr. Kernia, there it is. Give it a kick. It <laughs> needs it. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a pat. Go ahead. I need it. Thank you. Know, you. We're going to actually work together. Yes. And I like this idea that I don't know what the world looks like. Next little while, we know that we have a new situation. We're going to get healthier, and um, I don't care if you're successful. I just care that you try harder. And, um, and to everybody out there, is that there's uh, an epidemic going on. Uh, we are learning, and I'm tired of people blaming whatever. No blame. Just get healthier and try new things. So we're going to try some new things, and we're going to explore that together. So please join us, and uh, let's move forward. Very good. So the old rule is heart disease and cancer are still number one and two killer. Um, and uh, we need to work hard at this. And this young lady came with a smile on her face. And, uh, and, and, and she's working 30 days at a time to be healthier. And she's part of our, our, our weight loss group. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is the food gang. Let's, 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 let's hear about the, let's the food gang today. You just backtrack one slide there. Who are these people? Go back there. So, um, you guys want to introduce yourselves? Not for sure. We can start with Steffi from the left. Hi, I'm Steffi. I'm uh, going into my third year in like, master studying health sciences, and I've been in like food club for over a year and having lots of fun with it. Nice. Thank you, Steffi. My name is Emily. I'm really excited to be part um, of Dr. Kearney's clinic. Um, I joined the clinic this summer, so I'm very excited to be a part of this project. Um, I'm going into my second year of health sciences at McMaster, and I'm really excited to be learning new things. And you know me, I'm the guy that's always pestering you, and I'm going to hopefully pester you in a nice way, in a very positive way to this information. So I'm a Davey. Um, I'm going into my third year of health sciences at McMaster. I've been at the clinic for a little while now and I've helped out with a few workshops and I'm having a really fun time talking to all of you guys and presenting information. Hi, I'm Subin. I'm also going to second year of health sciences at McMaster and I joined the clinic last winter and I'm also really excited to present to you at our PowerPoint today. Well, this is part of the uh, food gang. We have other members as well. So we all agreed to start uh, on September 14th a keto diet, and we welcome you all to, to join us for 30 days to a healthier you. Um, and we're going to show you uh, one way you might want to consider. So this is our book, 30 Days to a Healthier You. Um, and the book I'm very proud of. This is a book that it took about 25 years to write and it's the work of so many people. And this is one of, I think, the, one of the Bibles of uh, 
health. And uh, this has some recipes, for some strategies, for some science. We'll show you about that. Uh, and the, the good news about this book is that the book, all the proceeds go to, um, to help others. So one of the things is that we live in North America, a richer country. Um, we're trying to help people from, in, in Africa uh, with sanitation as well as um, water stations other parts of the world and also here in uh, Canada as well. So if you're interested in, um, in good information, there's a book called 30 Days for Healthier You. And we're also encouraging people to, uh, to try three different 30 day challenges over the next little while. Maybe the, the first challenge for you will be a, 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 a high fat diet. Uh, and see if that helps with, with support. And I know that people who get support and work at this, uh, a good thing will happen. And for your participation, uh, I will put that at $10 uh, into helping others. Um, and so, uh, to me, it's really important that uh, we're all in this together, um, and that my job is to help you get healthier. And, um, and I hope this will enjoy uh, the process. So, this specific focus for most of us is on how to lose weight. And if all goes well, I would hope that people can lose maybe 10 pounds um, over the next uh, 30 days. My goal is to lose about seven pounds. That's what uh, I'm going to try to do. Uh, if people can lose five pounds, that's terrific. Uh, and and uh, let's see if we can help lose five to ten pounds if you need to lose weight. If not, we can just prove your 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 diet and your health and uh, help somebody else. Uh, next slide, please. This is actually we're going to talk about smart goals. This is actually from the book, um, um, and uh, we'll spend some time talking about smart goals, but. Um, um, I'm not sure we want to talk about this right now. We want to be specific. They need to be measurable. Uh, they need to be attainable. They need to be relevant. I want to lose weight. Well, that's a great goal. I want to lose basically seven pounds uh, in 30 days. And what I'm going to do is measure my weight every day for the next 30 days. I'm going to use this new drive that we talked about using 30 days to help to you. This is attainable. I'm going to use lots of support from the people from the food gang uh, to accomplish this. Um, and um, I'm going to make myself available for different webinars and my team is going to be able to support you either through a webinar online, personal visit in the clinic if you feel that's the case, or, or a phone call or two. This is very relevant because um, being healthier, if I do get COVID-19, uh, I want to make sure I'm in the best fighting shape possible. And more importantly is that my goal is still to be working in position from the age of 100 where I plan to retire because um, I have um, uh, just over 39 years left to go, uh, 39 years in a couple of days, so uh, um, uh, I have to help you next. Uh, next slide, please. And this is actually available in the book online, um, and, and that's the time frame for this, and uh, so that's something I want to share with you. Um, um, and uh, we'll just move forward. Next slide, please. Great, thank you. So this is just a quick rundown and a table of contents of the content of our presentation today. And there are six main sections. We'll first be talking about the keto diet, and then we'll discuss the fish diet. So then we'll look at recipes, and then we'll also discuss some personal experiences and some quick summary slides. And then Steffi will be looking at staying on track with diets and different ways to track your progress. And finally, a DT will be discussing what do we do when we fall back into old eating habits. Yep, so the first thing that we're going to discuss is the keto diet. And um, on the next slide, you'll be able to see that a keto diet is a very low carb, high fat diet. Um, overall, it involves drastically reducing your carbohydrate intake and replacing it with fat. In a keto diet, at least 70% of your calories are derived from fat, less than 10% of calories are from your carbs, and less than 20% are from um, protein. And overall, the keto diet calls for 90% of daily calories to come from fat. And this translates to eating, on the next slide, um, four grams of fat for every combined one gram of carb and protein. So this is why we call the keto diet a high-fat diet. And these are a lot of numbers, 
And if you're following the keto diet and have trouble keeping track of the arithmetic, then there are apps and online programs that can do the math for you. And Steffi will be talking more about this later on in our presentation. On the next slide, um, you'll be able to see what a typical meal looks like. And we'll be discussing and comparing this to what a keto diet meal looks like as well. And according to Canadian food guidelines, a typical meal should be 50% vegetables and fruits, and 25% of your plate should be filled with protein, and the other 25% should be filled with whole grain foods. And making water your choice of drink is also really very important because other beverages like pop are highly processed and they contain lots of sugar. On the next slide, you'll see a keto diet. If you go back one slide here, this is what the Canadian diet should look like. It came out in 2019. Now, I look at most people's plates and when I hear what most people diet, this is not what's on the on the plate. Um, uh, most Canadians eat 60% of their calories from processed food, uh, which is going to make you overweight, going to cause cancer, going to cause heart disease and stroke. So if you keep the diet the way you are, um, um, not a healthy diet. Now, I'm saying this, this is sort of Canada's best look at what a healthy diet should be. And there's more than one healthy diet that you can do, but uh, put this in your brain. This is what you should be eating. You know, this is the fuel that should be going into your, into your, into your body. Um, and I'm sorry if that's not the food that's going into your body. Um, this is the food I'm trying to get to my body most of the time. Am I perfect? Absolutely not. Am I getting better? Absolutely yes. And you can do too. So you can decide if you want to make a small change, such as maybe I will um, uh, replace um, pop with diet pop and I'll switch to water, for instance. Uh, would be a good choice. Uh, maybe I'm going to have um, you know one vegetable uh, on my plate. I'm going to have a salad, whatever, in the dinner time, whatever. So um, our diets to be healthy requires the right ingredient, the right composition of the diet. So this is a standard, good, healthy Canadian diet. Um, I feel should look at. Yeah, so this is what a keto diet plate will look like. And you see two pictures here. The first picture is a little bit mediocre, and the second picture is a much better option, and we'll be discussing and comparing both of them. So on a keto diet plate, there's a huge difference between the typical diet plate. Um, there's a lot more fat. Meals can contain meal, uh, meats like ham, eggs. Um, there's lots of avocado and a small amount of cheese as well. Um, also, dairy is usually counted as a carb in the keto diet. And my question to you is, does this look healthy? And the answer should be, broadly speaking, no, um, because of the butter, as you can see in the bottom right corner there. So we want to replace saturated fats like butter with things like olive oil, which is an unsaturated fat and much more healthier. And um, that's what we've tried to show in the picture to the right here. So we've replaced some of the fatty meats with um, fatty fish instead. So salmon, for example, we've proportionized everything to make sure that we're still getting the 50% vegetables and fruits, 25% whole grains, and also 25% protein as well. And um, some foods that we recommend eating on the keto diet include fish, nuts, and quinoa. And you can also have chicken and some meat uh, if you'd like to. One of the things is processed meat um, are full of nitrate, nitrates are carcinogenic or full of salt. Um, I always say that uh, a strip of bacon is basically cancer on a stick. Um, yeah, it tastes good. Um, now, if you want to go on a high fat diet, and if you get to the top of the uh, and you can measure that by measuring your urine ketones, you will probably lose some weight. But is that the diet you want to be on for the, the rest of your life? Uh, I'm not so sure. But certainly, um, the uh, high-fat diet will make it easier for some of us uh, to lose weight. Um, is, is a, the, the recipes on the left is not a good long-term solution, but with the recipe on the right is not a bad solution. Um, and for some people, that would be very livable. Um, and uh, you can have a vegetarian form if you want to, or you can have a meat form, chicken form, fish form. What I'm going to argue is that we're uh, actually results of something called the reduce it trial that we talked about, where having uh, 
a higher content for curing K1 officials. It can decrease cardiac events by 25%. That's, 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 that's a big chunk of um, how you can, you can look at that. So um, well, there are many controversies. Um, um, is that butter is still not a, a great food. Uh, processed meats and, and um, processed foods in general are very poor choices. And also simple carbohydrates and um, packaged food that we see, most things that come in a packet are probably not too healthy for you. So uh, take a look how the diet can evolve. So um, this, this month um, I'm going to have more nuts, more quinoa, and uh, um, and we'll see how that looks. Uh, next slide, please. Go ahead, Mary. Yeah, so just as Dr. mentioned, let's delve a little bit into the debate on saturated fats. So that involves foods like butter. So some people say that saturated fats aren't as bad as some experts say, while others say that saturated fats have very negative health consequences. And the first side states that saturated fats increase heart disease risk factors, but not heart disease itself. And one example of a heart disease risk factor is LDL, which is also known as lousy cholesterol. We know that LDL is bad for the heart, but apparently when saturated fats are consumed in moderation, making up less than 10% of calories in the diet, there is little connection between saturated fat intake and LDL levels. Um, so that's the first side. And the other side, the other side of the debate, has a more negative view on saturated fats, states that saturated fats are associated with things like inflammation, increased LDL levels, and increased risk of heart disease. And LDL also contributes to plaques, as we know, which can lead to heart attacks. And the final verdict is really try your best to minimize saturated fats as much as possible by replacing them with healthier alternatives. So, for example, we've said this before, but we're going to say it again, really work on replacing butter with healthier oils, um, like olive oil, for example. Well, the important to realize this, when we go back to 1950, uh, where a guy called Hansel Key thought that all fat was bad for you and that we should replace fat with carbohydrate. The mistake we made was that all fats aren't created equal um, and that uh, the carbohydrates that you, that you consume, simple sugars are relatively bad for you, so table sugars, working full of white sugars, um, but the more complex carbohydrate found in fruits and vegetables and whole grains have a lot of health benefits. And we know from quite a long time that replacing uh, saturated fat, with saturated fat word is basically animal fat, butter, uh, dairy fat, green butter. Um, if you replace them with vegetable fats, uh, you will show some lowering of the LDL cholesterol, and that's, uh, that's a, a good thing. If you replace, if you replace those animal fat with sugar, uh, you can actually see a rise in triglycerides and the depression of HDL and rise in inflammation. So we've learned a lot over time that first message is, is that uh, fat is rich in calories. You've got to watch that message. Number two is that if you have a high fat diet and you get to a ketotic state um, where you're not consuming carbohydrate, you may actually, and science actually suggests that you actually eat less full calories if you can do it properly. Um, however, um, uh, you have to do it properly and you have to think of a long term solution uh, to this. Uh, so, uh, uh, so I'm going to limit um, my uh, saturated fat, so my, my, my meat fat and my dairy fat. Um, those aren't part of my, my diet today and they won't be tomorrow either. Uh, at this stage. And where they should be part of your diet's long term at this stage. Mm -hmm. So now we can kind of discuss how the keto diet can be improved upon. And the keto diet can definitely be improved. It's high in fat and it emphasizes eating protein. So try replacing animal based protein with plant based protein instead. And this will help control your caloric intake and improve weight loss. Um, additionally, the keto diet is very, very low in carbs, as we know, which prevents it from catering to individual personal needs. And to improve on this, try talking to your physician, work together to personalize your diet so that it works for you. And as we discussed previously, that can involve replacing some meat with fish, for example. And thirdly, the keto diet can be hard to stick to because you're consuming so few carbs. 
to address this, it's important to give your body time to adjust to this change and to be patient with yourself. And also note that you might be fatigued during this period of time of transition. And finally, the keto diet is mainly for weight loss, but it's hard to keep this weight off for a very long period of time. So to improve on this, we recommend combining the keto diet with um, consistent levels of exercise. And on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about specific strategies you can take to keep the weight off because weight regain is very common on the keto diet. So to prevent this from happening, make sure you're eating healthy foods even after you come off the keto diet. Um, you want to adhere to the Canadian food guidelines that we previously discussed, where 50% of your plate should be fruits and veggies, 25% of your plate should be protein, and the final 25% should be whole grains. And secondly, exercise on a consistent basis. This includes aerobic and non-aerobic exercise for at least one hour per day for most days of the week. And thirdly, avoid eating unhealthy and processed foods. I know how tempting it is to slip in that bag of chips when you're doing your groceries, but trust me, there are ways to make your food taste good while still being healthy. And we'll talk a little more about recipes later on in the presentation as well. Um, and finally, when you get off of the keto diet and reintroduce carbs to your diet, make sure you do this very slowly because if you go from eating very little carbs to lots of carbs, it will be hard for your body to adjust to this major change. My body can adapt. Can, I can eat anything, so I don't feel. So to me, is that uh, it, you know, I, I think you know there, there's some really good science saying that you can actually replace uh, some of that, some of those complex carbohydrates with a, a high fat diet, and you will lose more weight initially. So you need to adapt to that. Um, and again, it's, again it's the healthy fats you want to incorporate. The diet's a composition of uh, good and bad food and try to put more good choices compared to uh, bad choices. Mm -hmm. So on the next slide, we're going to discuss a little bit about the keto diet and your kidneys. Um, it's important to take a look at the keto diet and kidney function because generally the keto diet is safe for people with normal kidney function, but there are two major exceptions. If you have a history of kidney stones, um, you should consider minimizing the consumption of oxalates, optimize fluid and mineral intake, and also include moderate rather than high levels of protein. And for those who have advanced kidney disease, a keto diet might be dangerous. So we really highly recommend consulting with your doctor before making any changes to your current diet. And one way to mitigate kidney stones is to make sure you have two glasses of water before every meal. Having somewhere about 10 glasses of water or two of water a day will help lower weight and will uh, decrease the chance of having kidney stones as well. Mm -hmm. um, on the next slide, we're going to discuss a little bit about how the diet actually works. So the goal of the keto diet is to enter something called ketosis through fat metabolism. And our bodies normally burn carbohydrates or sugars for energy, but on the keto diet, very low levels of carbohydrates are consumed, which allows the body to break down stored fat into molecules called ketones. And the body will use these ketones instead of carbs for fuel. And this process is known as ketosis. Um, ketosis is a normal physiological process. There's nothing dangerous about it. It's just that with the keto diet, you're kept in that process all the time. And on the next slide, we'll discuss a little bit more about the foods that you should eat on the keto diet. So if you're Let's just backtrack one slide again. So one of the things that um, people who either use intermittent fasting or going on a, 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 a keto diet is that, again, uh, some people feel that their concentration is better uh, and they're not as hungry. And so uh, there's good um, reasons to think this may be something for you. It may not work for everybody. Um, so um, when um, I start to look into this, is that you know there's, there's more than one way to, there's more than one diet appropriate. And like anything, is trying different things and see how this fits. So if it's something you want to try, I, I think it's really worthwhile to try. Um, and one thing is that if you want to know if you're in a ketotic state, is that you can get some ketone sticks and you can check your urine on a, on a daily basis where you know your urine will get that, 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 that different smelly uh, 
texture or smell to that, and maybe a darker urine. Um, and uh, so, uh, so to me, is that uh, it, you might feel a little bit sensitive to euphoria, and over time, you might you might suppress your appetite. So I'm always hungry, so I'm curious to see if this is going to help suppress my my appetite. Um, so uh, you know, here's the science again: you're just switching metabolism, sugar, and fat, uh, and made part of a key part of the state. Uh, which you can actually measure in your urine or your blood if you want, because the urine test, uh, urine dipstick is something very readily available, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm, yeah, so now we're going to be discussing some of the foods that we recommend eating on the keto diet. The first choice is meat, and this includes chicken and turkey. It's even better to be eating plant-based protein like tofu, for example. And eggs, we recommend looking for pastured or omega-3 whole eggs. Cheese um, is also recommended just in smaller amounts. Unprocessed cheese like cheddar, goat, blue, or mozzarella would be good additions to your diet. And butter and cream. So we recommend looking for grass-fed options when possible and also replacing butter and cream with olive oil or other healthier alternatives. Nuts and seeds, this includes foods like almonds, walnuts, and flax seeds. Um, fatty fish, such as salmon, trout, tuna, and mackerel are also very highly recommended. And um, second to last, we have healthy oils like olive oil, coconut oil, which you can use as a spread, and avocado oil. And finally, there's some low-carb vegetables such as tomatoes, onions, peppers, and other options that we will discuss in further detail later on in this presentation. Well, if you look at this uh, diet here, so for those who like eating red meat, you can eat red meat um, uh, if you prefer chicken or fish uh, or plant-based uh, uh, proteins. Uh, I'm, I'm, myself, what I'm going to do is that uh, I'm going to have fish at this point in time. I've, I've um, stopped eating meat because I think it's better for the society and the environment and better for animals. Um, I feel sorry that I'm still consuming fish and I have to rethink that as time goes on. I'm going to eat a little bit of egg, but I'm going to eat mostly egg white. And I'm going to put a little bit of cheese in my egg white omelet. I'm going to put, um, I take I take egg whites, put all the, um, the low carb vegetables, put it in the microwave for two minutes, and I have this little omelet. Uh, I'm going to eat a lot more nuts and, uh, nuts and seeds. And uh, I'm not going to eat butter. Uh, I'm not going to be basically eating very much in the way of uh, oils. I'm going to try to eat my food that. Uh, uh, process. However, one of the things I want to do is that uh, I love, I'm going to try some clam chowder. Instead of having butter in the clam chowder, I'm going to put it with extra virgin olive oil. We're going to see how that tastes. So I'm going to try some new things, and uh, I'm going to try. I'm going to measure it points in my urine on a on a regular basis and see if I can get to that product state. Um, oh, I'm curious to see what everybody else is going to do. So let's go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Again, different strokes for different folks, but I love the fact that, that we're going to learn about portion things here. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead, Amy. Yeah, so we're going to be talking a little bit more about serving sizes and calories in this next section. So for lean meat and fish, the serving size is 85 grams, which is roughly the size of the size of your palm, which is actually very small. Um, and the general number of calories in a serving of meat is about 150 calories. For fish, it's 90 to 145 calories, depending on what kind of fish you choose to eat. For nuts and seeds, the typical serving is 14 grams, and here are some pictures of what that actually looks like in real life. And a serving of walnuts has 90 calories. Almonds, they have 80 calories. Pistachios have um, 80 calories as well. And finally, pumpkin seeds have 60 calories. And on the next slide, what are calories? Mm -hmm. yeah, on the next slide, we're going to look a little bit more at beans and eggs. So for beans, a quarter cup is recommended for sufficient protein, while half a cup is recommended for vegetable intake. Um, a quarter cup is roughly half the size of your fist. So if you take your fist and you split it in half, that's about a quarter cup. Um, sorry, half a cup. And there are approximately 60 calories in the serving size of beans. For eggs, on the other hand, one serving size is just one egg or two egg whites. And in one egg, there are 80 calories, but even better, if you choose to only eat two egg whites, that's only 34 calories. 
we can decide is that cholesterol content to food is not as, as important as uh, saturated fat uh, raising cholesterol. Um, one of the things that the mistake we just looked at cholesterol content is that, that there's other effects of uh, uh, composition of a diet from inflammation to endothelial function uh, to other lipid protein called remnant particles, triglyceride, HDL. So in the past, we just focused on the LDL cholesterol. It's much more complicated than that. So um, again, what we're, we're talking for, for most people is trying to lose weight. So what, if you feel you want to have uh, red meat, you want to have eggs and egg yolks and things along those lines, but you feel that's something that's important for you, that's fine. Um, I'm looking for long-term solutions to it as well. So I'm, I'm going to eat more egg whites and I am going to have uh, eggs. Um, one thing I do when, when I when we sometimes go to the egg and I for breakfast as a family, and it really annoys me you have to pay more to have the egg white omelet. So in that situation, I'm a cheapskate, I'll have the regular eggs, but at home I'm having the egg white. So I'll pay the extra thing at the supermarket, but I don't want to pay it at the, uh, at the, at the restaurant there. That's just a personal preference. So, um, and, uh, one of the foods I love to eat too is, is lobster. It takes me like two hours to eat a lobster. It's, uh, there's not that many calories in a lobster. I don't, I don't have butter with my lobster. Um, and uh, it does have a high uh, cholesterol content, but it, uh, it has very low saturated fat. And it's rising cholesterol ability is high, but new information. So part of my uh, high fat diet is going to be uh, lobster or treat every once in a while. And I can afford it. Yep. So on the next slide, we'll talk about um, the calories and serving sizes of yogurt. So the serving size for yogurt is one cup, and that's the size of your fist. So it's really not that much. And um, if we look at the calories for Greek yogurt, full fat, that's 200 calories. If you're looking at low fat, that's almost basically halved, 110 calories. And yogurt with sugar is not recommended at all. That's 240 calories. So that's just extra calories that you don't want to be consuming and also extra sugar, which has negative health consequences as well. Now, there's some data that the high dairy content of food makes you feel full and you actually eat as little calories. Um, and, uh, and maybe the full-fat yogurts and, um, may, may work better. I think that's a controversial area. So... What I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to compromise. So my wife and I have decided that we're going to have Greek yogurt. We're going to have the plain, low-fat version in the house, which is half the calories. Um, and uh, certainly we're not going to have the, the sugar content. We're going to put a couple walnuts in that, a couple of berries that will dress that up. And the reason Greek yogurt has a higher protein content, and there's more of a sense of being full um, and, and, and doing that. So, uh, uh, everybody's going to do things differently, but to me, is that uh, uh, yogurt certainly has a, a role to play in this work. Is that and that's something to explore? Thank you for sharing that. I'm not sure. That, I'm just telling you what, what we're doing. I'm not saying it's the right solution. But this is something that we've been thinking about this for a while, and uh, I just want to share how I'm going to approach that. And other people might feel differently. It's so, um, just an example there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So on the next slide. We're going to talk a little bit more about hummus. Personally, I really like eating hummus. It's really tasty to me. And one serving size of hummus is about a quarter cup. So that's a quarter of your fist. If you were to divide your fist into four parts, one part of that would just be the serving size of hummus. There's 88 calories, approximately 90 calories in that serving size, four grams of fat, and 80 more grams of sodium. Um, so basically... Um uh, the hummus that we, we, we buy now. Chad has his homemade hummus, and I'm going to ask Chad to share his recipe with us to uh, 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 look at that. Is that uh, hummus, as you know, is constant beans, and uh, it does have uh, carbohydrate. So my wife said hummus is out. It has too much fat. Uh, that the ratio of uh, fat to carbohydrate is too high in carbohydrate. But saying that, I think hummus is a, is a reasonable compromise of food. Uh, if I do what you remember, he tablespoons of, uh, of olive oil is about 110 calories, two tablespoons of uh, hummus is on average about uh, 60 calories. Uh, so you are eating uh, less calories, um, or even 60 to 80 calories, depending on the version you can buy there. So 
I think is that um, I'm going to be putting hummus on um, on uh, celery, on uh, broccoli, on cauliflower, on green pepper. Uh, Emily, where are you going to put your uh, hummus? What do you take? How do you eat hummus? I usually eat the little crackers with hummus, which is probably a lot unhealthier than eating it with broccoli. So I will try to make the transition to eating mm-hmm. it with vegetables. Yeah, so if you don't want the keto diet, crackers yeah. with hummus. Yeah. So, um, so uh, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. On the next slide, we're going to look at some keto-friendly vegetables. So. There are some vegetables that we recommend eating and some that are not recommended because they're too high in carbs. And of course, on the keto diet, it's a very low carb diet. So some of the things that you should avoid include foods like potatoes, squash, sweet potatoes, baked potatoes, yams, peas, corns, basically anything that's high in carbohydrates. And the vegetables that we recommend eating include asparagus, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, celery, cucumber, and many more options that you can see down the list. And a serving size of vegetables is a cup for raw vegetables, which again, as we said previously, is about the size of one fist. And it's two cups for leafy vegetables. So if you get the little packs of um, salad or mixed greens from the grocery store, that would be two fifths for one serving size. And approximately the amount of calories in those serving sizes is about 120. I didn't know onions had uh, that much carbohydrate. They're tough. Yeah, I think in large doses it has lots of carbs, but I feel like if you were just to eat like a quarter or half an onion, it shouldn't be too big of a problem. Nice. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and on the next slide, we're going to discuss the keto friendly fruits. So these are some fruits that are recommended in the keto diet. Um, to the left, you have the fruits that are lower in carbs. To the right, you have foods that are higher in carbs. So we want to avoid the things to the right and focus on eating the fruits that are to the left on this diagram. So that includes fruits like watermelon, cantaloupe, coconut, lemon, peaches, and things like that, and avoiding foods like bananas. And again, the serving size for a fruit is one cup, which is the size of your fist. And the calories in the serving size can vary depending on what fruit you're eating, but generally ranges from 60 to 100 calories. And on the next slide, these are some important notes about the keto diet. So you may have noticed that keto foods are typical unhealthy foods. And it's important that we don't fall into the trap of thinking that we're doing a good thing by eating unhealthy. Um, So in order to avoid eating unhealthily, it's important to eat healthy substitutes. We mentioned replacing things like butter with olive oil. It's also important to restrict your caloric intake and also eat in moderation. So make sure you're eating those specific portion sizes and you're not eating too much um, because that's going to lead to extra calories that you don't want. So these are some foods to avoid on the keto diet, and as a general rule, any food that is high in carbohydrates should be limited. So that includes foods that are very sugary, like soda, juice, smoothies, ice cream, candy. Um, it also includes grains or starches, like bread, rice, and pasta. Fruit, you want to limit fruit, except small portions of berries, like strawberries, and we discussed the certain fruits that are okay on the keto diet in the previous slide. And low-fat diet products, um, these are to be avoided as well because they're usually highly processed and high in sugar as well, also high in carbs. Uh, Condiments and sauces, these contain sugar and unhealthy fat, just unneeded calories that you don't need in your diet. Unhealthy fats like processed vegetable oils, margarine, mayonnaise, these are things you don't want to eat as well. Alcohol, this is a big one. It's very high in carbs. This is, again, to be avoided. Um, You really want to limit your alcohol intake. And finally, sugar-free diet foods are also not recommended because they're high in sugar alcohol. They're also very highly processed. And um, so on this slide, we're going to talk a little bit more about the serving sizes and calories on foods to avoid. So on the left side, you see the serving size for grains and starches. We think that the grains and starches should take up half a portion of your plate, but really it shouldn't be. The leafy greens, the vegetables should be taking up half of your plate, and 
your greens and starches should only be taking up a quarter. That's something that we discussed at the beginning of the presentation as well. Um, so a serving size for grains and starches includes a um, sorry half a cup of cooked rice, um, pasta, cooked cereals, or cereal, um, a slice of bread, and a cup of cereal. And then um, for alcohol, this is also something, as we said, to be avoided. The serving size for this includes 40 grams of liquor, 140 grams of wine, um, or 340 grams of beer. And up in the above picture, we have a little diagram showing just what that looks like in real life. Um, for condiments, the serving size is half a teaspoon, which is actually the size of half a dice. So that's very, very small. And the amount of calories is only five in ketchup. But again, that's only if you're eating half a teaspoon. If you're eating like two tablespoons or more, then you're going to be ingesting a lot more calories. And candy, the serving size for that is 30 grams which is actually the size of your index finger or less. So that's not a lot of candy at all. And the number of calories in that amount of candy is approximately 200. So it's extremely calorie dense. So a very small amount of candy that you're eating. And in the next slide, um, we're just going to discuss a little bit more about why people choose to go on the keto diet. And the reason that people choose to go on the keto diet is mainly for the health benefits. So some of these health benefits include weight loss, um, benefits for people who are diabetic, and improvements in other health conditions. And we'll be discussing these three specific benefits in more detail in this presentation. So what's interesting is that um, um, you can measure weight, you can measure your blood sugar, and, uh, and some people have a sense of um, their, I think anybody who's on a diet and doing well, uh, those are their quality of life. I think when you're not doing well, uh, your quality might go down here. So these are things to explore. And at one time I thought that, uh, the keto diet wasn't a very sound diet, but after further reading, I found that you can do it actually sensibly, and it, and it actually um, does, uh, um, doesn't affect your triglycerides. It does keep these markers of inflammation. Um, it doesn't have a fall in LDL, uh, HDL cholesterol. Um, so there are some potential benefits, and as you pointed out initially in the reference we talked about, the long term is the long term if you look at that, but for many of us, losing weight is actually a priority, and it, 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 it's something worth exploring, but again, I'm suggesting uh, a more healthier keto diet um, than uh, from the traditional ones that we see. Mm -hmm. Yep, so on this slide, we're going to be discussing weight loss. So research has shown that the keto diet is an effective way to lose weight and lower risk factors for disease, as Dr. Primu just mentioned. And furthermore, people also achieve faster weight loss on a keto diet compared to a low-calorie diet. Um, however, as we mentioned previously in our presentation, it's hard to keep the weight off over the long term. And this is because eating low levels of carbs forever isn't a sustainable option because lots of foods contain carbs. So to maximize weight loss, it's important to try a keto diet to jumpstart re weight reduction, but choose to eat healthy sources of fat and protein like olive oil, avocados, and nuts, and after a few weeks, switch to a reduced calorie Mediterranean-style diet and increase your physical activity, and that will help with long-term weight loss. And on the next slide, we're going to discuss a little bit more about the benefits for people who are diabetic. And diabetes is characterized by high blood sugar and impaired insulin function. And the keto diet provides health benefits for people with diabetes by helping them lose excess fat, which is closely linked to type 2 diabetes, prediabetes, and metabolic syndrome. And one study found that the keto diet actually improved insulin sensitivity by 75%, so that's pretty major. And other studies have found that some people with type 2 diabetes were able to stop using all diabetes medications as a result of the keto diet. And we'll be discussing several randomized trials that further develop and elaborate on these results. And finally, some other miscellaneous health benefits on the next slide include um, heart disease. So it improves heart disease. The keto diet can improve risk factors like body fat, um, HDL cholesterol levels, and blood sugar, and blood pressure as well. Cancer. Um, the diet is currently being used to treat several types of cancer and slow tumor growth. 
There's also benefits related to Alzheimer's disease because the keto diet may reduce symptoms of this disease and slow its progression. Um, research has also shown that the keto diet can cause massive reductions in seizures in epileptic children. And finally, with Parkinson's disease, one study found that the diet helped improve symptoms of um, Parkinson's. So these are just some other miscellaneous health benefits that the keto diet has. Yeah, I'm not sure I, I buy into all these sorts of things at this week, but certainly these are some observations, and um, uh, I don't think this is sound um, accepted by most people in the field, but uh, something if you suffer from these illnesses, you might want to consider that and see if that helps or not, but uh, uh, the amount of science behind that is not particularly strong, but saying that, um, there's still lots to learn, and how you respond um, may be important to you. Yeah. Yeah, so here we're going to discuss um, the results of the diet. There are lots of benefits of the keto diet, and numerous research studies have been done to investigate these benefits. And one study was conducted at Duke University. It compared the keto diet to a low-fat diet by enrolling 120 participants from outpatient research clinics. And the study was a randomized controlled trial, which is very high-level evidence. And the study split participants into one of two interventions, the first being a keto diet plus nutritional supplementation, exercise, and group meetings. The second group was a low-fat diet, exercise, and group meetings. And the study found that participants on the keto diet lost more weight than those on the low-fat diet. Um, so that's, again, a major result. And the keto diet group lost an average of 12.0 kilograms, while the low-fat diet group lost an average of 6.5 kilograms. And the keto diet group also ended up with lower trigly triglyceride levels and higher levels of HDL, which is the good cholesterol. And both those on the keto diet and the low-fat diet had similar LDL or bad cholesterol levels. And overall, this randomized control trial has shown us that the keto diet can lead to effective weight loss, can lower triglycerides, and it can lead to healthier levels of cholesterol, which are all important benefits. Well, again, this is the highest level of evidence, a randomized controlled trial, but these are relatively small in size and of short duration. And that's a problem with most of the randomized controlled trials in this area. There are some large randomized controlled trials, probably with the public initiative, over 20,000 randomized, or, um, uh, but uh, unfortunately, compliance long term, people don't usually stick to the program uh, all that well long term. So, uh, so we have to rely on these types of information. So this trial clearly says in this group of 120 people who were overweight, having a keto diet lost twice as much weight compared to people over 24 weeks. It doesn't tell you about the long run, but it just tells you that um, you can see how powerful this could be. Um, um, and it's something that you may want to consider. What made this trial work more than anything was the support that went along with it. Um, I think we all know what it's supposed to do, and that's why I'm trying to that. That's why we, uh, we, uh, we're we going to try to get together to work with you and give you support. So we need to get other people's supports as well. So uh, it was great that my wife um, is on board about this, and uh, uh, without her help, it would be a uh, higher. And uh, one of the things that she, um, and so, so, so it's wonderful that you can see uh, how good science can help us, um, but uh, good science also. Involves um, motivating people, people willing to commit themselves to change, and getting supports to change too as well. So you have to find your supports as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, so this is another randomized control trial. Again, high grade evidence. It was published in Nutrition Metabolism. It also investigated the benefits of the keto diet. And this study was quite small, it only had 84 community volunteers with obesity, and type 2 diabetes, and these participants were divided into one of two groups. The first was the keto diet, second was a low-calorie diet, and this low-calorie diet was defined as a 500-calorie deficiency per day, and both groups received group meetings, nutritional supplementation, and exercise recommendation, and the study found that the keto diet group had greater improvements in something that we call hemoglobin A1C levels compared to the low-calorie diet group. And the hemoglobin A1C levels are just the results from something called the A1C test, 
which, which measures your average blood sugar levels over the past three months. So the lower these levels are, the better. And basically, the keto diet group, they had lower blood sugar levels compared to the low-calorie diet group. And um, additionally, this is really interesting, diabetes medications were reduced or completely eliminated in 95.2% of the keto diet participants compared to only 62% of the low-calorie diet participants. So overall, although this is a very small study, going on the keto diet can be helpful for improving type 2 diabetes. And on the next slide, um, we're going to discuss what these participants in these studies actually ate in the randomized control trial. So when a study is published, they'll provide information on what the participants actually ate during the entire diet. And what they said was they had um, certain amounts of animal foods like meat, fowl, fish, and shellfish, um, eggs. They also had hard cheese, but not that much of it. Um, two cups of salad vegetables, such as lettuce, spinach, um, and celery. A cup of low-carbohydrate vegetables, like broccoli, um, cauliflower, and squash. And limited amounts of cream, avocado, and lemon juice. Trans fats were minimized. They're very unhealthy. And, of course, drinking six to eight glasses of water daily is very important as well. Okay, yep, so we do have plants. Can you hear me? Yeah, go on. Sorry. Go, okay. go ahead, Steffi. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the third study. This was published in BMJ, and this is a really interesting study because they were trying to see if um, imitating the type of ketogenic diet would have an effect on en energy expenditure and weight loss. So this was another randomized controlled trial. It had 160 core participants. But what's interesting about this trial is that they actually had another study they did before, and they wanted to see who could lose weight. So the 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 number of participants that were able to meet that goal weight were able to participate in this study. So that was about 12% weight loss in a um, run-in diet phase, which was about 9 to 10 weeks. So from that cohort of participants, they took 164, and they put them into three different groups. One was a high-carb diet, which is 60% carbs of your diet, which is like the typical Canadian or American person. Another with a moderate-carb diet with 40% carbs, and then low-carb diet, 20% carbs, which was to imitate ketogenic type of diet. They also standardized for the other types of things they would be eating, like proteins and stuff like that, and they wanted to see the effects on energy expenditure, which is the calories that you really burn per day. So what they found is the, the study went on over 20 weeks. That energy expenditure was the greatest in the low-carbohydrate group relative to the moderate and high. And additionally, the low-carbohydrate group was most successful in maintaining the weight that they had lost initially in the, uh, the first part of the study, which actually, um, what, what they actually did in that first part of the study, they limited people to eat 60% of their normal um, calorie intake for 9 to 10 weeks just to give some background information. So the low carbohydrate group, in addition to being able to maintain that weight loss, they were also they found were also to have found lower levels more. of ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone. And that's kind of what gives you that appetite and that wanting to eat, the desire to eat. So that was lowest in the low carbohydrate group, and that was a significant difference. And what they found or they concluded at the end is that the low carbohydrate diet, which is similar to keto diet, may be effective in improving the success of obesity treatment. Nice. Okay, so now we'll be discussing the fish diet. And on the next slide, we'll just be discussing some general points about this diet. Um, if you go to the slide before this one. Yeah. Um, so the fish diet is a vegetarian diet that includes fish or other aquatic animals, and to follow a fish diet, you'll consume meals that include fruits, vegetables, grains, legumes, and seafood. And we'll go over the specifics um, of certain foods to eat and avoid while on the fish diet a little later in this presentation. So here are some of the reasons why people decide to go on the fish diet. There's lots of reasons why, but one of them is the health benefits. And that includes improved heart health, protection against cancers, um, reduced risk of diabetes and inflammation, and also keeping the environment healthy. So 
So if we first discuss heart health, um, the fish diet leads to better heart health because eating fish, especially fatty fish, provides increased long chain omega-3 fatty acid intake. And an omega-3 fatty acid is an unsaturated fat that is beneficial to your health. And people who eat fish have lower blood pressure, lower risk of abnormal heart rhythms, and fewer fatal heart attacks than those who don't eat fish on a regular and consistent basis. And apart from fish, the fish diet also emphasizes eating vegetables and plant foods. And this leads to a reduced risk of coronary heart disease as well. And other research studies have shown that diets high in vegetables can reverse um, plaques when combined with exercise and stress management. So these are just some of the benefits. So the data on fish is uh, relatively mixed. Some of the trials show uh, benefits, some, some don't. And uh, um, we're going to explore a couple of trials that uh, that uh, relatively new that uh, sort of are influencing our behavior right now. So uh, let's keep moving forward there. Right. Yeah, so next we'll be talking about cancer. And again, some of the research on this is mixed. So again, take this with grain of salt, but a fish, a fish that has been shown um, in some studies to protect people against certain cancers. And um, colorectal cancers are just cancers that affect the colon and the rectum. And these cancers are actually the second leading cause of cancer deaths in the U.S., even though it may be less commonly known. And one study used data from a cohort of um, quite a number of people, almost 80,000 people, and found that the fish diet has strong protective effects against colorectal cancers. And in the next slide, we'll be discussing diabetes and inflammation. So following a fish diet can reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes which um, and metabolic syndrome, which includes things like insulin resistance, high blood pressure, and obesity. And this is because plant-based diets are high in anti-inflammatory and antioxidant agents, which have anti-diabetic properties. And finally, the last benefit that we'll be discussing on the next slide includes helping the environment. So in addition to the health benefits from a fish diet, another main reason why people choose to go on the fish diet is to protect the environment. And the farming of animals like pigs and cows can harm the environment because these animals emit greenhouse gases. Um, for example, when cows fart, they produce methane, pigs produce ammonia, and on a global scale, these gases can contribute to global warming. And large-scale deforestation for grazing and agriculture can also make the greenhouse gas issue worse. And um, finally, although trawlers that are used for fish farming can still affect water ecosystems, eating fish has much less of an environmental footprint on the earth than eating pork and other kinds of red meat. So one of, one of the things you have to think about is that um, uh, I think uh, plant-based eating fruits and vegetables are, are by far superior for the environment, uh, the worst are the animals. Um, and fish are somewhere in between. And um, part of the, the, one of the main reasons I gave up uh, meat um, and chicken was that it was for the animals and for the environment. But I'm still a hypocrite that I, I ate fish. So uh, I'm hoping that we can have synthetic um, a fish in the future that will solve that particular problem for me. And uh, so I'm, I'm still evolving my thoughts, but I, I think it's that uh, um, there are ways of improvement. And that, and that one of the things that people who are a vegetarian point out is that our fish supplies are dwindling. Uh, there's contamination of fish, there's plastic in the ocean right now, and that uh, our current way of fishing is not sustainable. And uh, fish farming can be harmful, not done properly. So, um, but I think overall, uh, it's worth the health benefits of fish at this point in time. And, uh, um, and uh, thank you for sharing that. And we'll keep uh, we'll keep learning. So, uh, the final chapter is uh, uh, are still to come, and we're going to share some exciting new research as well that is it, it, also a game changer. Go ahead. Yep, so here's just a quick rundown of the foods to eat on a fish diet. So if you're interested interested in going on the fish diet, here's some suggestions. For fish, we recommend canned sardines. Now, um, sometimes sardines can come in canola oil. That's not recommended. Um, we recommend taking and buying the sardines that are in water or tomato sauce because you don't want to be consuming lots of oil. 
Um, we also recommend salmon, salmon, sorry, tuna, fish ticks, um, foods like mackerel and trout are also recommended, and shellfish that include shrimp, clams, scallops, lobster, as Dr. Kearney was talking about, um, fruits and vegetables, of course, cereals and whole grains like oats, corn, and rice, um, things called pseudo grains, so that includes quinoa and buckwheat. These are also gluten free, legumes and legume products like kidney beans, pinto beans. Um, tofu, hummus, and finally seeds, which includes flax seeds, hemp seeds, and chia seeds. So what's interesting is that if you go to uh, so uh, some of the um, the beans, I'm a big bean fan, but they do have a high amount of carbohydrates, so I'm going to have to limit that during my keto phase. Um, I also found out there's uh, there's fat and quinoa, uh, flax, walnut, almonds, chia seeds, and all these types of seeds that are uh, something I'm going to enjoy more for the next uh, 40 days. I'm going to miss my oatmeal. I'm going to miss my uh, my, my bread, pasta, um, like that. But we'll show you some different ways. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of a fish diet plate. Um, it's a lot closer to the Canadian Food Guidelines plate compared to um, some of the keto diet plates that we were showing you in the in other parts of the presentation. So again, just to emphasize. It includes 25% whole grains, 25% lean protein fish, and 50% vegetables on your plate. And you can refer to the previous slides about different serving sizes and calories if you're interested in that information. So uh, we just tried some cauliflower potatoes, and uh, they were really quite good. So basically cauliflower, a little bit of milk, and a little bit of olive oil. And it tastes bad, uh, pretty much well. like mashed potatoes, and uh, so... Uh, Wow, I didn't know that existed until uh, a couple of days ago. So he's uh, teaching a little guy some tricks and things that nature as well. So lots of improvements that we can all make. Yep, so now we're going to be talking a little bit more about the good health content in vegetables, and there's lots of good nutrients in vegetables. They're naturally low in fat and calories, um, no vegetables have cholesterol, but that being said, sauces and seasonings can add fat, calories, and cholesterol to a meal. So that's why we recommend cutting that out of your diet. Um, additionally, vegetables are important sources of potassium, and diets rich in potassium may help to maintain healthy blood pressure. And vegetable sources of potassium include things like sweet potatoes, uh, white potatoes, white beans, tomato products, um, beet greens, soybeans, lima beans, all different types of beans. Again, if you're on the keto diet, though, we don't recommend eating sweet potatoes and potatoes in general because they have lots of carbs. But if you're on a fish diet, that's a separate and different diet. And so even like, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to try to be effective. I'm going to try to cut my uh, carbohydrate content down for the next three days. I'm going to try to get into a product state on a, on a regular basis. So um, I'm going to lose some of the benefit from... from fruits and vegetables and high fiber foods because um, um, I'm going to give some of those foods up but I'm going to still have, you know, lots of broccoli, lots of spinach, and kale, um, and uh, so, it's, uh, so it's interesting how to approach this and you have to decide in your, in your, in your mind because you have the beans, so you're going to have the steak, or you're going to have uh, some other things, so, um, but if you want to be a purist to the keto diet, that, that what was that initial ratio from the beginning there, Emily, what was the ratio with that? Uh, Fat in your diet, around seventy percent it was, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was seventy percent, I believe. Yeah, seventy percent fat, ten percent protein, and twenty percent uh, uh, carbohydrate. Uh, and for many of us, over half our calories are carbohydrates. I love carbohydrates, and uh, I'm going to see if it's going to help my food craving at nighttime or not. Uh, uh, so uh, happy to try something new right now, but I feel kind of stuck sometimes. This is a uh, a way of looking at that. Mm -hmm. So just continue. Oh, if you go to the previous slide. There we go. Yeah. So eating vegetables also provides your body with something called folate. Um, and this helps the body form red blood cells. And vegetables also contain high levels of fiber, which helps reduce blood cholesterol levels. And it can also lower the risk of heart disease. Um, fiber is also important for proper bowel function, and fiber-containing foods like vegetables can help provide a feeling of fullness with eating fewer calories, so that's always a plus. 
And finally, vegetables also contain high levels of vitamin A and C. Vitamin A keeps your eyes and skin healthy and helps to protect against infections. While vitamin C helps heal cuts and wounds and keeps your teeth healthy. And um, on the next slide, we're going to be discussing the health content in fish. Fish is a low-fat, high-quality protein that's filled with vitamins like vitamin D and vitamin B2. And fish is also rich in calcium, phosphorus, and it's a great source of minerals um, such as iron, zinc, iodine, uh, magnesium, and potassium. And all of these vitamins and nutrients work together to lower your blood pressure and help reduce the risk of heart attack and stroke. And eating fish is also important because it's a source of omega-3 fatty acids. These essential nutrients keep the heart and brain healthy. And two omega-3 fatty acids found in fish are EPA and DHA. And our bodies don't produce omega-3 fatty acids, so we have to get them through the food that we eat. And omega-3 fatty acids are found in every kind of fish, but they're especially high in fatty fish, like salmon, for example, trout, and mackerel. And if we just look at the specific breakdown of EPA and DHA in these three types of fish, salmon, trout, and mackerel, we see that salmon that's farmed Atlantic has the highest amount of EPA and DHA combined. Um, then there's also trout, which has 0.3 grams of EPA and 0.7 grams of DHA in a serving. And um, the mackerel that has 0.5 grams of EPA and 0.7 grams of DHA in a serving. So one of the things that's important between, we'll explain why the difference between, so basically EPA, DHA are the, the fish fats. Um, and if you look at, well, for those who have 38 notes on page 143, it talks about different contents of um, uh, EPA and DHA. Uh, because what it looks like is that we know for sure that DHA, DHA um, EPA behave differently uh, for cardiovascular health, and we'll come to that just in a few minutes from now. So. Um, and unfortunately, the supplements you get in the, the food store are not pure with contaminants, and they're uh, uh, they're uh, not pharmaceutical grade. So, uh, so I'm going to try to get as much as I can from um, from food, and then uh, we'll talk about whether or not we should supplement back or with uh, yay. Yeah. So we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Yep, so this is just a picture from Dr. Kearney's book, 30 Days to a Healthier You, and it talks about the specific breakdown of things like salmon oil, salmon um, that's farmed Atlantic, and salmon that's wild Atlantic. There's herring, mackerel, trout, tuna, and halibu as well, so that just has the breakdown, it's just a quick chart, a breakdown of the EPA, DHA, and ALA um, measures in these foods, so this is a nice reference tool that we can definitely be using. So ALA is the vegetable form of uh, omega-3, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. And on the next slide, um, we're going to discuss what is the difference between EPA and DHA. So EPA reduces cellular inflammation through one example of a pathway. It uses many different pathways. This is just one example. So. EPA is an inhibitor of an enzyme that's called D5D, and this enzyme produces a molecule called AA or arachidonic acid. And so if you have more EPA in your system, your D5D enzyme will be inhibited, and that means you're going to be producing less arachidonic acid, and that leads to less inflammatory eicosanoids, which improves heart health overall. If you compare that to DHA, DHA is structurally different from an EPA molecule. It takes up more space than the EPA in the membrane. I think it has more carbon molecules and a double bond in there somewhere. And it allows um, DHA to make membranes, especially those in the brain, more fluid. And that leads to something that we call the sweeping motion, which disrupts these lip lipid or fat rafts within the cellular membrane. And it makes it hard for things like cancer cells to survive. This also reduces the entry of enlarged LDL particles, and together that all improves brain function and eye health. And just as a quick aside, I know that um, Dr. Kerner mentioned this previously in the, in the presentation, but just to touch upon pesticides in fish, there's a higher concentration of pesticides in the skin fish. And again, this was mentioned previously, but our fish supply may be depleted soon. So keep your eyes and ears open for more data and more information. 
So this is actually an important slide to go through. PA, one of the fish facts, um, seems to be more important for heart health. It decreases inflammation. Uh, for DHA, maybe more important uh, for your eyes, for your brain health. So uh, we'll have to look at that. And, and uh, we'll have to look at more data on that right now. And uh, we're going to come to that in just a few minutes. And I prefer to get as much as I can my uh, vitamins and minerals from real food, not from supplements. Uh, the supplement industry, uh, by and large, has been a multi billion dollar industry. It gives us a false sense of security. And when we actually test most supplements, um, they may not contain it on the label, number one. And number two is that they're also enough cardiovascular protective or cancer protective. Mm -hmm. On the next slide, um, so this is a question that we ask ourselves. How much fish do we actually need to consume to consume four grams of pure EPA? And there's a study called the Reducer trial, which discusses pure EPA in a second, so we'll get to that. But in a normal serving size of salmon, there, that's 85 grams of salmon, that contains maybe 0 0.6 grams of IPA. So if you were to do the math, that means you would need to consume seven palms worth or 566 grams approximately in order to get your four grams. Um, so that's a lot of fish, which is why supplements are also taken. What's that kind of interesting is that uh, one year, uh, Rachel was kind enough to uh, prepare me a dinner uh, that had four grams of uh, pure EPA, and that she found out that's when we found that Atlantic farm salmon had the highest concentration of, uh, of uh, EPA. Uh, different than Pacific salmon, and uh, you know, it was, a, was, a, was a quite a bit of salmon, but that was something that was uh, very enjoyable, was a very enjoyable meal. And <laughs> I hope to uh, reproduce some of that in uh, the next little while. Well, seven servings, huh? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And on the next slide, um, we'll be discussing the reduce it trial that I just mentioned. So the Reducer trial studied the effect of an omega-3 fatty acid called icosapin ethyl or IPE on patients with heart problems. And we just learned that omega-3 fatty acids are common in fish. We're about to learn that omega-3 fatty acids have positive effects on your health. So that should further convince you to incorporate fish into your diet. And the Reducer trial was a randomized control trial, which is, again, very high level of evidence and it enrolled 8,179 patients with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, or other risk factors. And these patients had been taking statins. They were randomly assigned to one of two groups, the first being the IPE group, where they received two grams of IPE twice daily, and the second was placebo, where they received a sugar pill. And the study tracked the participants for 4.9 years. So this is a very high quality level evidence um, study. And it found that the risk of ischemic events, including cardiovascular death, was significantly lower among the patients who received the two grams of IPE twice daily than those who received the placebo. And ischemic events, that's just a fancy term for when um, blood flow and oxygen is restricted or reduced in some parts of your body. And what does this mean practically? Well, the study shows us that IPE has positive effects on cardiovascular health. And it's an omega-3 fatty acid, and omega-3 fatty acids are found in fish. So the conclusion is, please eat fish and adhere to a fish diet. Um, one of the important stats that was found from the study was 25% reduction in cardiovascular events. That's a significant figure that should be taken seriously. Well, this to me is a game-changing trial. We, we just showed you some data in uh, that 120 people for 16 to 24 weeks can lower your weight by, uh, by you know, six kilograms. This trial, 8,000 people who had cardiovascular disease, had diabetes, high risk for cardiovascular disease. We also include people with triglyceride greater than two in the trial, that taking four grams of, of pure EPA a day on top of statin therapy, which is you know, high dose statin therapy lowers the risk of heart disease by 50%. Uh, if you take it for five years or greater, so here you see a game changing trial that shows a reduction in cardiovascular events by 25%. So, uh, pure EPA, 4,000 milligrams of four grams a day, uh, 
lowers the reactive protein, lowers the triglyceride and particles, stabilizes membrane, causes EPA levels in the bloodstream to go up. And this actually brought rid of a quarter of all heart disease, things like heart attacks, still need for bypass surgery, recurrent cardiovascular events. Um, so this was a game changer. Now this was done internationally, including the United States. Uh, there was a trial called Gillis, uh, a huge trial of about 17,000 patients done in Japan many years ago. This time used about 1.8 grams of pure EPA. And the background fish consumption in Japan is three to four times that of North American. And that showed about a 20% reduction of cardiovascular events. So this is real. We have two major big randomized controlled trials that pure EPA uh, decreases cardiovascular events. EPA is found in, in salt water, ocean fish, um, and it's hard to get, I don't know if anybody's going to eat seven servings of salmon for the rest of their life every day, um, and uh, so we're still learning about this. So this tells me without a shadow of doubt that, uh, that uh, having EPA in our system is cardiovascular protective, and uh, so that's, uh, that's no small feat um, at this stage, and um, um, and this is actually not the fish oil supplements you get in the stores. It's not, it's, um, if you look at most preparations of uh, fish oils, and most of it is uh, contamination, you want to look at just the EPA content, and you probably are going to get a rancid form when you buy it. So um, that's not where you're going to get this for. So you want high grade, pharmaceutical grade, pure EPA at this point. Um, um, game changing trial. This is the second time this has been done. Um, Next slide, please. Now, this is a trial called the STRENGTH trial. Uh, this is a huge trial undertaking. This is actually 13,000 patients. This was actually randomized to pharmaceutical grade EHA and EPA. Um, the problem with this trial is that this trial, I think the huge trial was stopped because of futility. Um, and so the trial hasn't been published at this point in time, but uh, this actually had um, um, four grams of combination of EPA and DHA, and it had a reasonable content of uh, EPA in this. In this trial, uh, I'm looking, at, I'm still waiting to digest this trial. It hasn't been published at this point in time. So this raises the possibility, as it raises the possibility that EPA may be good for the heart, and DHA may be bad for the heart. But this is still speculation. Uh, on, on my part at this stage. So um, when we think you know something, there's much, much, much more to learn and science goes at the pace over here. Emily, is there anything else you want to say about this trial at all? You want to add to that? No, I think you covered it all. So I've been waiting for, for, for uh, this trial was ended, um, I think around March or so of this, of 2020. So. Um, I'm still waiting for publication, release of information. So, um, um, and uh, one of the things that Steffi is going to be working on me on, on, on this, on, on with me this uh, this this fall and winter time to try and understand um, um, fish oil, DHA a lot more, um, and also talk about vegetable forms too as well. Um, so uh, we have a lot to learn, but there is great excitement and there's great value to. Uh, EPA at this point in time, so um, I'm pretty darn excited. There is a form that you can get in Canada um, uh, by, by prescription. The drug is relatively expensive, and if you look at our triglyceride video, there's a whole uh, discussion about that, so uh, take a look at that one uh, for more details. Now, Predimed. So we talked about, so Emily was telling you or suggesting that um, Instead of butter, uh, think about either nuts or think about extra virgin olive oil. How's that? Well, in God we trust, everything else needs data. This is a large scale randomized controlled trial. 7,447 patients. So 7,500 patients that was done in Spain uh, who were randomized to a Mediterranean diet with extra virgin olive oil. So people were given extra virgin olive oil delivered to their home on a regular basis. That was randomization one. A, a, a third got a Mediterranean diet and they got mixed nuts. And the mixed nuts 
uh, were, I think, were uh, walnuts, almonds, and was it hazelnut poisoning? Is that right, Emily? The third nut was hazelnuts? Mm -hmm. Yep. And then they were, or the third nut was randomization to a heart and stroke low fat dairy. So we have a Mediterranean diet with extra virgin olive oil, or a Mediterranean diet with mixed nuts, or a standard heart stroke low fat diet. And it turns out is having extra virgin olive oil or mixed nuts showed cardiovascular protection. So that's what I'm saying is that, that we saw that initial keto diet and that, that in 1950 we thought that all fats were, were bad and 1970s to 1990s or so or to 2000, we learned that saturated fat um, can, your, your, your health can be improved by replacing with uh, the animal fats and the dairy fats uh, with vegetable fats. And uh, we're also learning very strongly that, that you know, in, that, um, that there, if you take away fat in your diet, you have to replace it with something. Uh, and replacing it with refined carbohydrates, uh, processed foods is a terrible thing. Um, and we have this epidemic of weight gain right now, and none of us can at least afford it uh, at this stage. So. Um, we are saying this explosion diabetes has always tripled since I've been practiced um, hip replacement, knee surgeries, Alzheimer's disease, atrial fibrillation, now congestive heart failure is exploding. And how much you weigh has a very much impact on, on these events dramatically and also unfortunately with uh, an infectious process such as COVID. So one of the things you have to realize is that as you gain weight, your body goes into a chronic inflammation, your immune system doesn't work well. So if it's not working for one infection, it's probably not going to work with other infections. It's also more prone to cancers, but we know that certain cancers such as breast, colon, uh, are very much associated, or cancers are associated with your weight as well. So I, I see a great emphasis right now is on, on really spending time learning and finding better ways to lower your weights. Um, and this Pediment tells us that, that nuts um, um, are, 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 are a good choice and maybe extra virgin olive oil. So when I, extra virgin olive oil is the first press, so I'm recommending more olives. So when I have my, uh, well, we're, we're going to make pizza next Friday. We're going to study whole wheat crust. We're going to use a cauliflower crust. Uh, we're going to put olives on it. I'm not going to use olive oil. We're going to have like a batter that... Um, with tomato sauce, all those vegetables that you talked about, um, and tomato, and just a very much of a small touch of little hard cheese, and put that, not too much of that here. So this they argue very, very strongly uh, that nuts uh, can be a foundational food, and that extra virgin olive oil or olives would be a good, cho good choice. Um, but have to remember is that one gram of that left fat is still nine calories, and that's twice as many calories as protein and carbohydrates. So what has to be very important for portion control. Um, and so if you go into a high ketonic state with less carbohydrate, if you feel full and you're eating less, it may be a good choice for you. And it could be a long-term sustainable thing too if you use it properly. So um, having um, you know nuts, having olive oil is not a bad choice. But I worry about the, the lack of fruits and vegetables and the lack of grains in some people's diet because it makes them full of acid and mineral content of food. So uh, over the short term, uh, losing weight is a good thing. Over the long term, we'll have to decide how that fits in uh, into your diet. And so the number one source of protein for the planet still should come from beans. So beans are, uh, are less destructive to the environment compared to fish and to meat and to fish as well. So well. Uh, um, we have to sort of think about that long term, but for now, uh, there goes uh, most of the beans, there goes the potato, there goes the, the bread, there goes the um, um, whole wheat pasta at this point in time for the next little while. Um, and then comes the nuts, and here comes the, the olives. My God. And, uh, uh, this is good science that we're showing you. Um, anything else you want to add to that, Emily, or anybody else? Well, I think that was a really good rundown. Let's get to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a trial, the Neon Diet Prevention Trial. This trial was done when I first was becoming a doctor, and this is a trial of 605 patients. But 605 patients is not a huge trial for cardiovascular disease. 
but the fact then it was a big trial. And this was actually a, that done in Lyon, France. So if they can do actually a uh, dietary intervention trial in France, you can do it anywhere. So they were randomized to something called alkaline acid, uh, basically a Mediterranean diet supplemented with a uh, rich margarine uh, that was containing uh, ALA, the vegetable form of omega-3. And uh, this actually showed a dramatic reduction in cardiovascular events. Um, where are some of the, uh, what do we find is, where's ALA found from again, Ben? Where are the foods are found? Are found it? Sorry? So what foods are rich in ALA, vegetable omega-3, the foods contained it? Well, we discussed how fish was really high in omega-3, and it has ALA as well, and um, the chart that we showed in the other slide, I think. Yeah, so ALA is more of a vegetable form, so basically DHA and EPA are more of a fish fat. But things like uh, black, um, quinoa, um, and walnut have a higher concentration of ALA, so that needs to be studied further. Um, but this suggests that you can use some of the vegetable forms of um, of the of, uh, omega of to be helpful. Uh, they don't get converted very rapidly or very well. Only one to two percent will get converted to pH and EPA, but they may have some extra benefits. That's why I'm going to eat more walnuts in my, uh, my, my diet and more nuts in general, and that may be one of the benefits. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. So, this is actually a, a couple of slides saying that at one time, uh, Fats were bad, but that wasn't that simple. Is that uh, because replacing fat with saturated fat did lower LDL cholesterol, but it did cause triglycerides and HDL to go up? Now we're learning that um, the composition of the diet is much more than just a lipid effect, it's an effect on oxidative stress, inflammation. And one of the things that um, uh, fish fats or uh, EPA may affect, it may be a good antioxidant in the tissue level, and basically, when you have oxidized um, fat at the wall, much higher incidence of um, causing acidosis. So, at one time, we prescribed vitamins, e, beta keratin, vitamin E, the hope is being a good antioxidant. It is a good antioxidant, but it's in the blood vessel, not the tissue level. So, those trials of vitamin supplementation are, are negative, and that. So, the, the people who benefit from um, Vitamins are the people who sell it to you at this stage, unfortunately. So, um, but it uh, looks like uh, pure EPA uh, might have some protective effects at the, the, the fully access product plaque is taking place. So, lots to learn. We're learning more at this point in time. And this is actually from the BNJ article that just came out recently in 2020. So, uh, we'll give you a link to that at some point in time if people want to put more details. And Stephanie is going to be working on this issue a little bit more. We're going to do some separate work on this, this year. On understanding uh, uh, EPA, DHA, LA, and fat in general, fish fat. So we have a lot to learn. Uh, but saying this is that uh, that's why I think if you're going to go on a high fat diet, there's good evidence that um, uh, high fat uh, may be good for your brain, for arthritis, and, and for your heart as you the focus. And we learned a lot, we still more to learn as time goes on. Uh, next slide, please. Um, am I doing this one or are you doing this one, Emily? Mm -hmm. I think this is um, Paul's slide for you, Dr. Cream. Okay. So, uh, so that's why we have some of the differences between different nuts and things of that nature. I think we talked about this right now. Um, ALA is basically the nether with a vegetable fat. Um, and it, um, it, uh, it's found in, in things like hemp. Uh, chia seeds, flax, walnut, oatmeal, uh, whole wheat bread, avocados, kidney beans. So these are these are some foods that we should be incorporating in our diet. Um, the Leon Diet Trial actually used a supplement that um, the margarine um, showed a 70% reduction in cardiovascular events. Now, no one believes that trial is that good, but uh, that's why, you know, we need, we need real whole food that listed above that makes sense to me. Uh, and the Extra virgin olive oil, as we saw in, um, in pretty much show reduction of cardiovascular events. So, um, again, um, I'm not a big fan of oils in general, but with calories, I, I'm more interested in food. So, olives are a better choice in my mind, but extra virgin olive oil, first, 
stress of that. So uh, less refinement uh, of that. So, so to me, um, um, when I'm going to make my clam chow to enjoy that, I'm going to replace the butter with the extra virgin olive oil uh, source of uh, that content for that. So, uh, so there's the science to try to explain that. Uh, next slide, please. Yep, so on this next slide, we'll be talking a little bit more about the glycemic index, which is just a number. It gives you an idea of how fast your body converts the carbs or the carbohydrates in a food into glucose. And some foods can make your blood sugar shoot up really fast. And that's because carbohydrates like refined sugars and bread, those are easier for your body to change into glucose, which is the sugar that your body uses for energy. So if you eat a lot of these easy carbohydrates, you'll have a hard time controlling your blood sugar, even if you're using insulin and diabetes medications. Um, so the glycemic index gives you a way to tell slower acting, quote unquote, good carbs from the faster bad carbs. And you can use it to fine tune your carb counting and make sure that your blood sugar is more steady. And on the next slide, um, we'll be talking about the different scores. So this overall, the smaller the number on the glycemic index, the less of an impact the food has on your blood sugar. So less than 55 on the glycemic index is low, which is a good thing. 50, um, 56 to 69 is medium, and greater than 70 is high, which is bad. And on the next slide, um, to find the glycemic index for foods, if you, yeah, there we go. Um, look for it on the labels of packaged foods. So you can also find the glycemic index lists for common foods on the internet. Um, I know that Harvard has one with more than 100 different foods on that list, and that's just a screenshot from one portion of the glycemic index. And as a general rule, foods that are close to how they're found in nature tend to have a lower glycemic index than refined and processed foods. And on the next slide, it's, we explain how it's also important to consider the bigger picture. So the glycemic, the glycemic index shouldn't be the only thing that you consider when you're making choices about what you eat. The fact that a food has a low glycemic index doesn't necessarily mean that it's super healthy or that you should eat a lot of it because calories, um, vitamins, and minerals, those are still important. So for example, potato chips actually have a lower glycemic index than oatmeal and about the same as green peas, but obviously oatmeal and green peas have more nutrients. And portion sizes also matter as well. The more of whatever kind of carbohydrates you eat, the more it will affect your blood sugar. And next, Susan will be talking a little bit about recipes that you can try. I, I, um Next slide. Yeah, so um, I gathered a few resources from the internet that you can access to uh, find good keto and fish meals. So one of them is diabetescanada.ca. So um, this is a great website because they offer a variety of uh, recipes along with the nutritional breakdown. So for example, on this slide here, we have skillet chicken breast with tomatoes and olives, which is good for a keto diet. Um, and you can see the nutritional breakdown on the left. And some of the recipes also come with a little video that kind of goes step by step into how to prep the food. And if you go into the next slide, uh, they also have some fish recipes that you could try. So, for example, this one um, also comes with a nutritional breakdown as well. Um, it doesn't come with a video, but it has a detailed um, how-to in the on the actual site. And next slide. So this is an interesting recipe. It's called a keto pasta carbonara with zoodles, and it's from a website called dietdoctor.com. And they also offer the nutritional breakdown of the meal. Um, so if you're not familiar, a zoodle is basically noodles made up of zucchini, so kind of like spaghetti squash if you've ever tried one. Um, and they're made using a spiralizer, as you can see from the video clip there. Um, I can go a little more into the differences between the past, between like a traditional pasta and a zoodle. Uh, and this recipe also does call for butter, but we'll also talk about um, two other butter alternatives. So next slide. 
Yeah, so here we have spaghetti, like the traditional spaghetti you can buy at the grocery store, and then we have zucchini pasta, which is zoodle, and then spaghetti squash. So the obvious difference here is the calorie content. So spaghetti has around 221 calories per serving, which is around one cup, whereas zoodle has around 32 calories, and spaghetti squash contains around 42 calories. Another important uh, nutrition to look at here is the carbohydrate content. So there's around 43.2 grams of carbohydrates in spaghetti, uh, which, can, which is around 14% of a 2,000 calorie diet. Um, and if you look at for zoodles, it contains around 6.6 .6 grams, which is which only makes up around 2%. And for spaghetti squash, it uh, contains around 10 grams, which makes up 3%. So the obvious healthier choice here would be to go for the zucchini pasta or the spaghetti squash over your traditional spaghetti pasta. Next slide. Okay. Um, yeah, so here are a few other butter alternatives that you could use. Um, not all of them are great for a keto diet, for example, like the beans on the bottom, which can be all of carbohydrates, but if you're just on a fish diet, you could uh, puree them and use them as butter alternatives. Other people like to use avocados or olive oil, as we previously mentioned, and applesauce, nut butter, uh, Greek yogurt, or uh, coconut oil as well. Uh, and you can also find great resources on the internet or from uh, cookbooks about how to substitute uh, butter with these other ingredients. So for example, if your recipe calls for a cup of oil or butter, you could replace with that. You could, you could replace that with a half a cup of applesauce or um, one cup of avocado. So one of the things that I think people talk about is coconut oil or coconut fat. Coconut is a saturated fat, uh, at least the oil it is. Um, and I don't think there's a tremendous amount of literature to support that coconut oil is a healthy food at this point in time. So um, I'm going to stay away from coconut oil at this point in time myself. Um, uh, from my eyes and ears are open to learn more about that, but I don't think there's enough evidence to persuade me that that's a good thing. We just showed you the Predimed where extra virgin olive oil showed tremendous cardiovascular protection and nuts showed cardiovascular protection. Um, uh, coconut is um, more uh, theoretical, and uh, I don't think the science is that uh, that great with this. Thing. But you know, I'm willing to change my mind as more science comes out. With them. And uh, so, if anybody has some good science to share on that, I'd be appreciate to hear more. Go ahead, there, Suda. Did uh, we lose you? Are you able to hear us, Susan? I think we're getting some technical stuff there. So what's going on there? Are there any questions right now from anybody or any comments on the internet that we've seen so far? Or? Um, we had... Some people talking. Oh, hi, sorry. I think I lost connection. Oh, no, that's okay. Don't worry about it. We're, we're, we got you back. Okay, we'll get to those questions. Just go ahead and see that. What are you going to get back? Okay, so um, we have here like two comparisons of different recipes. I think she's just having a little bit of coconut oil on the side there and made her have a brain memory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so here on the left, we have a clam chowder recipe, which uses um, olive oil and on the sorry, uh, sorry, which uses butter, and on the right we have a clam chowder recipe which uses olive oil. Um, and so obviously the difference here you can see is the calories again. So um, a per serving, the clam chowder recipe which uses the butter has around 250 calories, whereas with olive oil um, you only have about 200 calories. And the other content is the fat content. So where if you use butter, um, it contains around 13 grams of butter, uh, of total fat, which makes up around 17% of the daily value for a 2,000 calorie diet. Um, and with uh, olive oil, it only contains around 5 grams, which makes up 6%. So 
So one of the things is that uh, my fish traditionally, I, I always remember having clam chowder growing up, so I'm going to try uh, some clam chowder along the way, and I'm going to try it with the, um, with the um, olive oil. So I'll, I'll get back to you. I'll, I'll, I'll be curious if anybody else wants to try um, clam chowder with olive oil and see how that comes out. Thank you for sharing that. No problem. And next slide. Yeah, so these are some of the, rest, uh, the resources that I mentioned. So Diabetes Canada, Diet Doctor, and the other ones on the slide, like Taste of Home, BBC Good Food, and Homemade Interest, are some of the other recipe sites you could try. Um, and that they also uh, like offer you a nutritional breakdown for all of their recipes. So you can see how much carbohydrate content, how much fat content, and how much calorie each meal has. Yeah, and next. Yep, so next we're going to be discussing some personal experiences from Chad. Um, so he was very kind enough to put together some slides and we'll just be discussing his experiences with all of you. So Chad's one of our um, uh, buddies as well. Um, he's um, very much a plant-based eater. He's not too crazy about the keto diet in general, but that he's willing to, to learn like the rest of us. But uh, go ahead there, and then we want to hear about what Chad has to say. Yes, uh, so he's going he's to be part of our cooking club as well, and he's a great cook. I'm looking forward to going shopping with him hopefully this weekend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as you said, Dr. Kern, that's completely correct. He leans a lot more towards plant-based eating rather than a keto diet. Um, so on the next slide, we'll just discuss some of the main points. So if you continue to click on the slide, yeah. So he's describing how he believes in a whole food plant-based di plant diet. Um, and Stuart, just feel free to click on all of the bullet points. Um, but his personal opinion is that um, a calorie is... A calorie. So if you eat the same number of calories, let's say 2,000 calories on a traditional keto diet, which is very high fat, low carbs, versus 2,000 calories on a balanced plant-based diet, which one do you think is going to help you thrive more and protect you and ultimately lead you to greater longevity? And of course, it's the diet that doesn't consist of the saturated fats or the antibiotics and the meat and all of that. It's the diet that gives you a balance of macronutrients it's the diet that gives you enough dietary fiber. Um, that's the diet that's actually going to help you. So even if you're consuming the same number of calories on the keto diet or the fish diet or a plant-based diet, it's ultimately the nutrients that you're getting at the end of the day that are going to help you. So that's his rationale for why he leans more towards the um, plant-based whole foods diet rather than the keto diet. Now, it's interesting, there are some randomized data that we just showed that if you go on a high fat, high keto diet, you actually have more weight reduction and favorable effects on uh, triglycerides and HDL. Um, but it also depends on what, how you substitute. And there's actually some head to head data looking at plant based eating versus the keto diet showing similar findings. So, to me, I think you have some choices here. Um, um, and so, and I think you also have to look at what works for you too as well. So uh, I'm, I'm curious to see how um, uh, the next little while looks at it. And there's some people who've done extremely well in the keto diet. And as you also point out, is it that, that something sustainable? I think that makes you look. Uh, Plant-based eating seems to be more sustainable uh, long-term as well. So um, lots of learning. And I think it's that uh, to me, it's always been flexible and trying different things this uh, if you're having trouble with your weight, then so um, I think we presented some good arguments uh, for a, a high keto diet, but also too we're going to spend some time in a separate webinar talking about uh, plant-based eating as well. Um, and uh, one of the problems with a uh, a high keto diet is it is a more expensive diet. Uh, fish is expensive. Um, extra virgin olive oil is more expensive. And uh, uh, one of the things that we're going to be doing next webinar with uh, Zoe is how to eat healthy for, for less, and that would be another topic as well. So we have lots of things to explore in the diet that's uh, going on there. Go ahead, and what else do you want to say about that, mm -hmm. uh, our experiences? Yep, so if you continue to click on the slide. So these are just some summary slides, again, to reinforce um, his experiences. 
that basically just sum up what I was just talking about, how 2,000 calories on one diet versus 2,000 calories on another diet, like, it depends on the nutrients that you're getting from either diet. Um, on the next slide... Um, this is just him talking about how, well, what if we try out a plant-based keto diet? And that's something that we were basically discussing. We were discussing making um, substitutions for some of the high-fat content in the keto diet and making it more plant-based. And um, Chad describes how he thinks, while a plant-based keto diet is much better than an animal one, purely because you're avoiding all the hormones, um, he's still not... A proponent of going above 20 to 25 percent of calories from fat regardless of whichever source so those are his opinions but that's just um again things to keep in mind and we'll be moving on to the next section i know that was a, a good point and i think is that uh, what worries me about uh, the uh, the high keto diet we don't really have a long-term track record uh long-term this good thing or bad thing, we have short-term data showing good weight reduction in theory, um, and uh, so um, and the micronutrients that will be missing uh, would not the the brain vegetables are uh, are something to think about. And so we you know so um, the good thing is the body can adapt for a while, but you know long-term diet, the long-term diet. I'm seeing this explosion of being overweight, and we can repeat the same experiment over and over again. Same result, so we can try some things. And uh, and uh, after looking at the BMJ series of articles and the webinars and the information that we gathered here for you, I think it's very reasonable to be on a, uh, uh, a keto diet for, for weight reduction and health and maybe for diabetes protection. Um, and uh, but I think a healthier form is a, a healthier form is a better way of doing it. So, uh, but one of the things, no matter what diet you're doing, is that. Uh, um, most of the guys we talked about are short term. We need to look at one, two years and long term results. So we need help on maintenance and keeping ourselves on track. And this is probably one of the most important parts of, um, uh, of our talk here. Uh, if we can, most of us will be successful at some point in losing weight, but most of us are really more successful in getting that weight back. Um, and most guys show you lose weight in the first one, three months and stabilize by six months, by a year. Uh, we're back to where we started from in many circumstances. So we need to put more emphasis on, on the maintenance phase. So I'm really looking forward to this section. All right, I can start off. So you guys have heard all the information about the keto diet, and now it really comes down to how do you really maintain this? How do you track your progress? Well, there are two really easy ways to do this. You can buy blood strips or urine strips, and what these two methods do is they track your production of ketone bodies, as Emily mentioned, which is the way to determine if your body is actually going into the state of ketosis. Um, so if you're experiencing the keto flu-like symptoms such as fatigue and headaches, then the benefit of testing your ketones is that the results can indicate whether you're in ketosis. So um, you can purchase these um, at drugstores or on Amazon, and I listed the prices. So the blood strips are considered to be a little bit more accurate, but the urine strips are also really easy to use. And um, there are several ways you can test them. So the urine strips, you can actually measure your ketone levels using a color scale. So the darker the, the strip appears to be means that you're in ketosis and the legend is very straightforward to read. And same with the blood strips, they have the scale that they can give you the information. So if you're gaining more energy and you're reducing bloating or swelling, feeling less hungry, having less craving, getting better sleep, they recommend you that after the first two weeks of adjusting to this diet, you're going to start to feel better overall. So another piece of advice that they mentioned in evaluating and tracking your progress is to keep a food diary. So you can actually track your calories and your macro intake. And I'm going to talk about some apps that you can use later on to do this very easily. If you don't want to actually go out and search up all the different food items, there are different apps that you can just take a picture and it can automatically find what food it is and um, give you the information or you could search it up. And they just say to pay attention to how you feel. Uh, next slide. 
So in addition, some other tips for maintaining your keto diet is remember to use healthy substitutions. I think one thing to keep in mind is that if you do search up recipes online, a lot of them will have a lot of unhealthy ingredients, such as using a lot of butter to cook your fish in. You have to keep in mind that you have to be very careful with the sources that you select and the types of foods you're consuming, as Dr. Kenyu and Emily mentioned, you want to make sure you're using healthy substitutes in general and really keeping in mind the amount of um, calories and fat in the items that you're choosing for your diet. So another thing to keep in mind is that the keto diet is typically best for weight loss and it's not necessarily um, sustainable long term. People typically go on this diet for a couple of months at a time. But the key is to really ease into the diet and then slowly transition outwards because otherwise you can risk the um, possibility of regaining the weight that you had lost on the diet, so you really want to transition out of it slowly. So you should also know that the keto diet is reversible. As I mentioned, you can regain that weight. So you have to really maintain a healthy lifestyle in general, and you can do this by choosing plant-based proteins like beans, tofu, things like that, and to also make sure that you calorie restrict if you're actually trying to lose weight on this diet, probably then maintain um, approximately 50 calorie cuts per day would lead to one pound of weight loss per week. That's just a general statement, but it really depends from each person. And also remember that long-term lifestyle changes lead to a healthier life and avoid weight regain. You don't really want to do this just for a couple months and then go back to your old ways of eating. I just want to emphasize that you really need to transition into it and out of it very slowly and effectively in terms of what you're selecting to eat. So next slide. So we actually made a little form that you can fill out, which is a template based on Dr. Kim's book, Smart Goals. So this is a way to really track your progress and goals plan for success. The purpose of the Smart Goal is to really ask the right questions. So when you're setting up these goals, you want to ask yourself, do I want to take your medication? Do I want to lose weight? You have to write down what your main goal is, and you want to make your goals and set deadlines. So that way your goal will be specific, measurable, and realistic, and having a time will make you hold yourself accountable. So an example of a SMART goal is I want to lose 10 pounds by December 30th, 2020 by following the ketogenic diet so that I can control my diabetes and reduce my usage of medication. Here I really specified everything that you want to do, um, for example, you want to lose weight and you have the timestamp by December 30th by following the ketogenic diet. That's your how. And then you, the purpose of doing it is to control diabetes and reduce your usage of medications. As mentioned in a couple of trials, it was found that going on the ketogenic diet actually has benefits of being able to cut medications down as well because your weight improves and your overall um, health status also improves as a result. So if you go to the next slide, I have a screenshot of the form that you can fill out. So the volunteers at the clinic want to work with you. And actually, if you fill out your availability, we can set you up either in a group or with a partner that can hold you accountable to this diet. Or if you're not really comfortable with that, we're also going to be doing one-on-one -on -one with the patient. So just fill out this form and email it back to us. And then we can get in touch with you. and help you work on your SMART goal. So you can go to the next slide. Perfect. I just want to say so, for those for those who will be looking for the form, I'm just going to put it in the description of the YouTube video so it's easy for you all to find. Um, we just wanted to mention one thing is the habit loop. In general, it's very hard to go on something that's so different, like a diet. And the habit loop is a way to kind of train your body to maintain this diet long term and we use it using the same kind of methods that runners have. If you ever wonder why um, a runner wakes up every single day at 6 a.m. and goes for these long runs, um, it's because they actually don't just love to be in pain and just have achy legs. They um, are programmed by this habit loop, which actually occurs due to the release of endorphins, which um, allows them to feel good and it creates a habit of running. So we wanted to use the same method to sustain you into the keto diet. So if you go to the next slide. So this is the SAD habit loop, and this is the standard American diet habit loop, and this is how 
many big fast food companies and processed food companies cause addiction of their products. So people typically have hunger and cravings, which causes your blood insulin levels uh, to lower, which increases your appetite. So then you eat sugar. And then you're eating it, you like it, you get addicted to it because it causes a release of dopamine, which is actually a hormone that leads to pleasurable feeling so that you associate that eating sugar with a good state of mind. So that causes your blood sugar levels to fall rapidly so you're satisfied. And then when you feel hungry again, you're going to want to do the same thing. So that's how people typically get addicted to sugar. But the good thing is that you can actually break this habit and we can use this for the keto diet. So go back to the previous slide. So in our habit loop, we want to show that um, discipline alone is not enough for majority of people to sustain the diet. So we want to get into this habit loop. So you would start off with your skew, which is when you're really feeling hungry. So your routine would be to go and eat your ketogenic meal. And then after that, this is the part that's most important. You want to give yourself a small reward. And by doing this, you're kind of training your brain to get addicted to this type of diet instead of the sugary diet. So some suggestions of rewards that you can use after eating your ketogenic diet is maybe a short meditation, making your bed to feel a little bit more organized, watching your favorite TV show, go for a walk, things like that that just make you feel relaxed and kind of get your brain to mimic the same effect of the sugary foods. And that way, when you um, are feeling hungry again and you go and you're going to be more likely to go into this habit loop of eating the ketogenic food. So this is just one suggestion. And if anyone wants to talk more about this, the students will be available later on um, to help you with your SMART goals and also talk about the habit loop. So you can go to the next slide, the app. So it can be a little bit tricky to keep track of your calorie intake and to really see the breakdown, the macros of the types of foods that you're eating. So I have three different apps that I posted. The first one is called My Fitness Pal, and this is really simple. It's a calorie and diet tracker. So you kind of just input your food, and it'll tell you um, the amount of calories and the macros in it. And it can also predict the weight gain or weight loss based on your meals of the day. So you can also put in your um, approximate calorie intake that's recommended for that day, and it'll tell you how much you have left. The second app I wanted to talk about is Lose It, and this actually creates custom suggestions for your calorie intake, and it's very customizable. It's based on your height, your goals, your weight, and your age. So it'll tell you if you're a little bit confused about how many calories you should be consuming per day. This app can determine a plan that's good for you based on your goals. And the last app is called Lifesong, and it allows you to scan the foods that you're eating. So you can break down the proteins, carbs, and fats, it's a little bit easier than the first one. Um, these are just different options that you can use you to help keep you on track with your diet and maintain your um, diet for a long period of time in a way that's easy for you. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about what to do when you fall back into old heat eating habits. And I'm going to start by talking about setting yourself up for success through like habit acquisition and making sure that you're transitioning into the diet in a way that's sustainable and good for you. So um, I'll start by discussing why we fall back into old habits. So there are both psychological and physiological factors that contribute towards falling back into an old behavior. And it's important to recognize and manage these signs. When you initially start like transitioning onto a new diet, it's forming a habit. And when you start out, if you're really structured and you're really planned over time, as you move away from that structure and plan, you might be more likely to fall back into your old habits. And that's because you're making changes psychologically and physiologically. So making sure that you set yourself up for success by following key tips and staying with the structure and the basics of the diet can really help you long term and ensure that you don't really fall back into those old habits. So an important thing to recognize is permission giving thoughts. So that's having thoughts like, oh, it's going to be okay if I just eat this one thing that's not supposed to be included in the diet. It'll be fine. I deserve this. 
things like that, those little suggestions that creep up in your mind can slowly amount to you engaging in a behavior that kind of goes against what you're trying to do. And another important thing to recognize is that when you're having cravings or thoughts or urges or anything like that regarding what you want to be eating or what you want to be doing, and it's the unfavorable kind, the one that's not in line with the diet plan, don't repress it. Because repressing those sorts of emotions can result in a slip escalating really quickly. It's important to try and replace it with something positive. So do something else rather than just trying to push the feelings down. Because ultimately, when it comes to eating, if you slip back into an old habit and it escalates, that can lead to a lot of negative things. Not only would you have gone off the diet track, but sometimes that can lead to binging or disordered eating. And those are things that you want to avoid. So how we learn a habit has a big impact on resilience and being able to stick to a habit. Ensuring that you are implementing and forming new habits in a meaningful way can help prevent you from relapsing or going back to an old habit. And you can go to the next slide. Yeah. So, um, you know, the old, average, old habits are hard to break and new habits are hard to form. Well, the good thing is that, you know, we are able to learn and through repetition, we can really enforce a habit. So habit acquisition usually requires attention, focus and purposeful repetition. The purposeful repetition is super important because the way we form associations is based on repetition. So eliminating old habits, that involves noticing early signs that a habit is starting, changing the circumstances associated with that habit. So for example, if you find yourself in the kitchen, you find that you're craving something that, um, you know, uh, isn't in line with like the keto or the fish diet and understanding like it's the kitchen that's kind of eliciting that emotion and taking yourself away from the kitchen. Maybe you're going to go into the living room or you're going to go back to your room, removing yourself from the situation that can help eliminate an old habit. And the important thing is that you intentionally do something to replace the habit. So as I mentioned on the last slide, you don't want to be repressing any of these emotions. You want to be doing something instead. So something that that comes up often is, you know, um, some people say that chewing gum can help suppress appetite. And there's some studies that show like the act of chewing flavorless gum actually decreases your response to visual stimuli and like food stimuli. So that can help you. That's intentionally doing something else. Um, some people say that they like brush their teeth when they feel hungry. There's not so much evidence that that thing helps, but it's another action that can kind of get you out of a situation. Or if you're feeling um, like this old habit or these old feelings are creeping up, maybe taking time to do something that's good for yourself or rewarding for yourself. If that means taking time to just like sit and relax and breathe, or if that means going outside and going on a walk, just finding different things that you can do place sensations that are associated with an old habit. And then learning techniques to help manage stress, because a lot of times transitioning into a new diet can be stressful. You're stressed because you want to stay on track, and that can sometimes impede on your ability to learn and form a good habit. So learning useful techniques to help manage that are very useful as well. And as I mentioned, it's not enough to just repress thoughts and cravings, which can ultimately lead to binging. So just making sure that along with purposeful re repetition, you're doing something consciously to address the issue. And part of preventing old habits is ensuring that you're replacing old behaviors with something new. So you're building sustainable behaviors. Um, habits usually have a trigger, and a memorable trigger can you can choose a memorable trigger to be a cue to engage with positive behavior. So, for example, if seeing like a stimuli of food is your is a trigger for you, it's a visual trigger. Using that as a sign that you should engage in something different, engage in something positive. So it's basically broken down into five essential steps of developing awareness, intentionally replacing a negative habit, eliminating negative triggers and then buddy up or um, pick up your friends. So that means, you know, finding someone to do the diet with you. It doesn't have to be like a close friend or anything. Sometimes you can just rely on an online support group. And picking up your friends is really the sense of community when you're building new habits. So if you have a misstep, you want them to be there for you. If they have a misstep, you want to be there for them. And then visualizing and being persistent. So don't, um, don't take your eye off the prize. Just keep in mind what your goal is. And just be persistent. You might have setbacks, but you'll eventually get there. You can go to the next slide. Yes, yeah, so the strategies to help you stay on track, so being mindful of urges, recognizing and paying attention to subtle behaviors that indicate returning to old habits. So a key one is permission giving thoughts. 
and then no, uh, noticing permission giving thoughts and blurring of enablers so a really hard thing to do sometimes when you transition onto a diet especially if you're the only one doing that in like your social group is that you're going to have temptations and enablers all around you who might not exactly be aware of the situation or why you're cho choosing to change up your diet so just remembering that you know those are going to be challenges and obstacles that you face and approaching that with a certain level of caution and just remembering your goal at the end of the day. Yeah. So if you do fall off track, the number one thing you should do is don't beat yourself up. Ultimately, it's extremely important that you be kind to yourself. You're making this change for you and you want it to be a positive change. You, associating it with like negative emotions or punishing yourself anytime you lose track isn't gonna help you out in the long run. So don't beat yourself up, it's okay. And then the next step is owning your behavior. So don't excuse the fact that you had a slip up. Recognize that, oh, I, I messed up. It's time for me to get back on track and own that. That's going to help you take the next step. And then an important thing, which uh, Steffi had touched on earlier in terms of keeping track, is making sure that you keep track of what you're doing so you can figure out what went wrong and how to make a change. So having like that detailed record or in that sense of like tracking and scheduling and planning is really helpful to go back to because if you do fall off track, it helps you see where you went off, where you got off track and how do you get back there. And then don't deprive yourself or punish yourself. If you're going back to your diet, it's important that you're not having like any negative emotions or negative actions associated with it. So just because you stepped away and you fell off track for a little bit doesn't mean that you should be punishing yourself and depriving yourself of something it's okay to still include like the right kinds of snacks or treats or um, activities that you engage in every day as long as it's in line with your goal and as long as it's in moderation just taking it away isn't simply the answer and then it's okay to ask for help and support so if you're really struggling you just rely on the community around you and those who are partaking in a similar journey and ask for their advice and find fun ways to inspire you to get back on track. So a common thing that's recommended in a lot of sites that advise on like the keto and the fish diet is looking up like recipes and finding ways to like modify it so that it excites you about cooking and about eating healthier foods and that can help motivate you to get back on track. And you can go to the next slide. Yeah. So just some tips. One being differentiating real hunger versus mouth hunger. So we all get hungry, but we don't always get hungry because our bodies need food. Like I know for myself, sometimes when I'm bored, I'll find that I'm hungry and I want to eat. And I'm not really hungry. It's just a feeling that's associated with an emotion. So making that distinction is extremely important. So um, the two recommendations are asking yourself these two questions. Are you hungry enough that you can like eat an entire meal? If you're not, then chances are you're not actually like hungry for food. It's just you're craving something. And the second question is, are you craving something? A lot of times when we feel hungry because our body doesn't require food, we're usually like craving some sort of food or craving some sort of like reward. So recognizing those two things can help you distinguish when you should be eating versus when you feel hungry but don't actually necessarily need to be eating. And then going back to the basics are really helpful. So if you ever find that you're getting off track, go back to pre-planning and meal prep and keep track of your foods and weigh your foods. Make sure you're aware of all the nutrients. And um, also figure out the contents of nutrients for weight loss and weight gain. That helps you with getting on track with respect to your goal and just kind of making it really methodical can help you have this sense of like structure that can help get you back on track and then the next thing would be accepting hunger and preventing self-deprivation so it's okay to be hungry being hungry is not something that you need to satisfy immediately it's okay to feel hunger so if you are feeling hungry um, first of all determining whether it's real hunger versus mouth hunger and then recognizing that just because I'm hungry, it doesn't mean that I have to like satisfy my hunger at this very moment. It's okay to have this feeling. And you can still have treats and snacks. Just make sure you're picking the right ones, the ones that are in line with the diet plan that you're on. So that kind of ensures that you're not depriving yourself of something. Because if you are depriving yourself of something, you're more likely to slip. So just make sure that you're not punishing yourself at the end of the day. 
and then make a few changes. So the biggest recommendation is just lots of hydration and fasting in between meals. So if you've said that you're going to have like say four meals a day, you're fasting in between those meals and then eating more protein that kind of goes with the idea of eating foods that are going to keep you fuller longer. So that are, you know, healthy, they have like a decent calorie content and it's going to um, make it so that you're not as inclined to eat snacks or eat different things in between that might make you more likely to fall off track with your diet. And you can go to the next week. So remember, you have to be patient. We don't necessarily learn in a linear fashion. We learn on a curve. It may take some time to get back to where you were, and that's totally okay. And remember your past successes. If you were on track and you got off track, you were on track once before. You'll get there eventually. All you need to do is make the right changes. And it's also important to recognize that sometimes your body might be working against you. So there are psychological and physiological components that contribute to making these changes. When you're getting onto a new diet, it's not just a mental change for you, having to adapt to those new conditions. It's a physical change as well. Your body is experiencing something new. And sometimes that takes time. It takes time for you to adjust. And it you know takes that repetition in order to get into that habit. So uh, one thing that's reported along uh, um, from a lot of people who experience like, a drastic form of weight loss. So there was a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that focused on obese patients who had used different diets to get down to a certain goal weight. People who got to the goal weight had a lot of difficulty managing their appetite around their goal weight. They were obviously able to employ strategies, and one of the key strategies was being able to like effectively ease off a diet. But the reason that they found that they were having difficulty managing their appetite is because hormones that regulate appetite can still persist in your bloodstream for significant periods of time after weight loss. And they're encouraging weight regain because obviously your body has had this drastic change. It's not really sure where its balance is set. And so you're motivated to have like more of an appetite to regain the weight you've lost. And that's a big um, trap that you can fall into. So making sure that you're easing your way off of the diet and recognizing that it might be hard once you get to your goal to keep it that way, but trying to make the small changes so that you're able to stay at your goal. And then these changes are new for your body, so it's okay if it takes some time to adjust, but be persistent and practice purposeful repetition so you're able to really own that new habit and make it so that you are less likely to fall off track and be more Yep, so this is just a quick summary slide just to sum everything up. Um, we recommend taking a picture of your fridge or your cupboards and we can empty out, empty them out for you virtually and help you to live a healthier life. And also weigh yourself as much as you can to track your progress. That means get a scale and use a buddy to track your weight loss. Often when you have a weight buddy or a weight loss buddy, that holds you more accountable. Um, try the keto diet, but substitute butter for extra virgin olive oil, beef for fatty fish, and other alternatives as well. Nuts should be your main source of fat, and of course limit oil consumption because we are not trying to get liquid calories. And on the next slide, um, we talk a little bit more about trying out different diets from the food game. And the start of this is September 14th, 2020 at 7 p.m. And we will be sending out a Zoom link for that. Um, we'll be discussing how to approach the keto diet. And if you're interested, please contact Dr. Kearney, 232 at gmail.com. We'll be meeting every week to track our progress and try different plant-based diets. And join us for some fun. And that is the end of our presentation. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, and we hope you have a lovely long weekend. Outstanding. Um, with, um, this is really very comprehensive, like in, like everything we do takes a lot of time, and I really enjoyed this one in particular because um, I really never thought about a keto diet being a sensible diet. Um, uh, I had some patients who said they had success, but most of the patients I see have success with, have success with this are overweight individuals who, who gain the weight uh, over time. Um, then you have people like Chad who are plant-based eaters who lost a lot of weight. Uh, we have really good data that 
how such a broad and direct that plant-based eating are associated with meaningful weight reduction. They can be sustained for over a year. Um, now I see uh, British Medical Journal came out uh, uh, early in 2020 showing that, that you can, with local experts, be on a um, high-fat uh, diet. Or, um, is that um, they, they are sustainable, and uh, and you can be smart about it. Um, uh, so I'm asking Dr. Put the microwave on just for another thirty seconds, and so I'll, I'll turn it on in a second. People want to check. It's okay. So um, my daughter just came in from work. I'm in my kitchen. Usually I'm doing these webinars from uh, from my office at, at night time. So it's nice today to be uh, to be there. Um, can you just just move that a little bit? Um, um, so, so to me, is that, that we're, we made great progress, and this is just an example of a whole team approach um, making this happen and making this work. Um, and you can see this is something that science is behind this, and that uh, we've learned that uh, that fish supplementation or fish oil, especially EPA cardiovascular protective, and how that may fit into your, your plan of action. Uh, so. So, so to me, is that we learned a lot. Um, there's so much more. But the most important thing is that we're going to want to regain the weight. And I feel really motivated to try something different right now. And so whether or not you want to join us for this, uh, whether or not you want to use it as a platform, uh, whether or not we can help in any way, um, uh, we're glad to. And the more people are going to join. And you're going to have to need to do this over and over again. I want you to enjoy the journey. I don't want people to be upset with the ups and downs of all of this. Um, um, and um, I really, uh, with um, with this pandemic, has taught me is to appreciate that each other and that, that how to work together. And this example of this this work is fantastic. Um, um, Emily, you, you put the lead in this. I picked on you a lot, and, uh, and you made this better thing. And everybody else, oh, you know this business about making this sustainable over time is really important, and, and we're getting better at this. So, um, uh, Stuart, do you have any questions or comments from people? Um, no questions. We had one person mention, what are your thoughts on alternatives such as based on margarine as opposed to butter? Well, so, so to me, is that um, um, butter is certainly a higher content of saturated fat. Um, based on margarine, it has more polyunsaturated, more vegetable fat. So I think it's a, it's a better choice. But it's also rich in calories too as well. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you have to decide how that fits into your, your, your life. Mm -hmm. I'm really trying as much as I possibly can is to use whole real food um, that, that, that hasn't been modified. And I, I think times when we modify things, we're not as good as Mother Nature. So Mother Nature took millions of years to get to this state, and that we're, we're not smarter than she is at this stage. So um, um, it's not a health food. It's a better choice than butter, um, but I think there's still better choices as well. Um, but for some people, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a second step. Um, Anybody, any other comments from everybody? Um, um, we're going to be working hard at this. This is not the final chapter when it comes to uh, the guides. I remember uh, the, the debate way back when, um, and uh, you can see this is evolving right now. So uh, uh, there's more to this than just um, cholesterol lowering. There's inflammation, there's stabilization membrane. There's also um, the, the, the gut microbacteria that we're learning about. There's just so much there. I know this is watermelon there, so watermelon's on my uh, keto diet now because it, uh, it uh, may have a high glycemic, but it's basically a lot of water in there. And I've already had about um, three or four glasses of water during this webinar, so I'm going to try my 10 glasses every day. Um, uh, any other points from anybody else at all? No, that was it. Well, listen, I want to thank everybody for just a, a wonderful discussion. This is a webinar I'm going to go back to and look at and study uh, over and over again. Um, I'm looking forward to spinning squash. I'm looking forward to um, lots of servings of uh, salmon and, um, and other uh, fish. I'm going to have um, cauliflower pasta. 
um, and uh, cauliflower, cauliflower uh, mashed potato. Uh, um, and uh, please join us if you want to do it by yourself. That's fine. If you want us to do it with you, that's fine. If you want one of our team members to reach out, you can certainly email us or certainly call us at the clinic, and uh, we'll get you started. And uh, to me, um, this book says 30 days or 130 days. This is 30 days, 100 times. So keep working, keep trying, keep getting better, and uh, have a safe week. And uh, for those who are interested, as it's Saturday morning, we're going to have a problem. And it's at 6.30 in the morning, and then a bike ride at 11 o'clock. And this week, uh, we're going to have a bike ride on a Sunday morning after at, uh, at 10 o'clock. My brother's coming to town, so uh, I, want to say, I want to have lunch with him on Sunday. So, wonderful. And um, I, I think Paul, I'm sorry, Paul Stewart, uh, you get the last word. With, with uh, What's your thoughts? Well, first, I just want to give a huge shout-out to these four stars. Um, this past week we had a little bit of a change in terms of our uh, webinars. We were going to do something else and so on short notice they pulled together and created a fantastic presentation. Uh, I certainly learned a lot. Um, I think what I'm going to be trying is uh, I'm not going to do a full keto diet but I do know that I can be healthier in my diet. I'm going to try and eat a little bit less meat, uh, transition more towards eating more plants and vegetables, uh, finding alternative ways to get my proteins. Um, and as, uh, as we talked about in today's webinar, um, budding up with a friend is a good strategy. So uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Kearney to hold me accountable to that and I'll hold him accountable to his keto diet. I'll message him regularly and make sure that he's sticking to it. Um, other than that, I, I really enjoyed today's presentation. I found that uh, it was deeply comprehensive. And uh, as Dr. Kearney said, I'm going to probably have to watch it a second time. Uh, just to internalize a lot of the things that uh, maybe I didn't the first time around. But uh, overall, it was a great presentation. Uh, and again, a huge shout out to these four. It was a fantastic presentation. And uh, thank you. These be wonderful. These, these young people are superstars like yourself. And uh, thank you so much for putting this together. And uh, we will uh, be talking to you soon. Uh, um, we're going to stick around to just discuss some of the things that we saw tonight. And I always try to get better. So. Get better, don't get angry, and, and enjoy the week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.